สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, who are here with us today and live here in the auditorium of Bangkok Art and Culture Center. And most importantly, to those who are watching our symposium program from home, whether it is in Thailand, Japan, Australia, or other parts of the world. Today, it is our great pleasure and honor to welcome everyone, both here and from home, to our international public symposium on culture and diplomacy in the changing world, its relations, values, and practices. This event is co-organized by the jointed hands of the Japan Foundation Bangkok, the Goethe Institute Thailand, the British Council Thailand, and Bangkok Art and Cultural Center, or BACC, with special contributions from Bangkok Art Binale Foundation. The purposes of this meeting are to explore the role of culture in the terms of diplomatic endeavors, especially in the context of the current world situations, and to think further about the possibility of international cultural practices and cultural collaborations beyond the dichotomy of internationalism and nationalism. On this occasion, may I please invite Mr. Yoshioka Norihiko, Director General of the Japan Foundation Bangkok, to deliver us a welcoming remark. Mr. Yoshioka, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening or good morning for the online participants. Uh, welcome to our international public forum entitled Culture and Diplomacy in the Changing World. Its, uh, its relations, values, and practices. This forum is aimed to uh, aim, aim to um, this forum aims to um, explore the new frontier of international cultural practices as diplomatic efforts of each national state beyond the dichotomy of internationalism and nationalism. As the editors of the book Cultural Diplomacy beyond the national interest point out, the cultural diplomacy by governmental bodies tends to be interest-driven, which is essentially more nationalism-oriented. At the same time, uh, cultural relations formed by cultural practitioners or cultural organizations tend to be interest, uh, sorry, idea ideals-driven, which is more internationalism-oriented. This difference of direction toward international cultural practices seem to be more and more apparent these days. This forum is starting from this awareness of this point, inviting prominent scholars and professionals as well as cultural practitioners. In the first session, we will discuss about the relationship between culture and diplomacy in each nation arguing how each nation interprets the key concept of diplomatic policies, such as soft power and new public diplomacy and so on. And in the second part, we will discuss about the relationship between such diplomatic policies and the actual cultural practices, mainly from the practitioner's point of views, and followed by the final session, wrap-up sessions in the end. During whole sessions, we would like to invite our audience to make your comments or share your thoughts or raise your questions online, as well as at the Q&A session for the, uh, for the attending audiences here, so that our discussion will be more diverse and dynamic. So I do hope you all will enjoy our forum and the following discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yoshioka, for the welcoming remark. And uh, so first off, before we go into our conversations, uh, I would like to summarize uh, about the whole overview, general overview of our discussions today. Um, my name is Severi Ryupai Boon. I will be the MC for this session today. My apologies for the late introduction. So since 
we are now operating, as Mr. Yoshioka said, as a hybrid program with online live streaming via YouTube Live for those who are joining us remotely and a live on site here at the auditorium for those who are attending here. Uh, I would like to introduce and explain how you can interact, ask questions, and share comments with us. First off, the program will be divided into two parts. We will touch on the theory, concept, and interpretation of cultural diplomacy in each nation for the first part. And after a brief break, we will then proceed to a roundtable under the topics of cultural exchange in practice, motivations behind planning and participation. This roundtable will be joined by insights from many cultural policy maker and practitioners from local and international co cultural organizations. For each part, we will have a Q&A session. For those who are watching us uh, online, please write down your questions and comments into the chat box of our YouTube program. We will pick up those questions and ask our presenters here at the auditorium. And for those who are attending uh, with us here, please feel free to raise your hand during the Q&A session and we will pass on the mic to you to have a conversation with us. Last but not least, after this event is over, we would very much appreciate if you could spare some time to fill out our questionnaire. For online participants, you can find the form posted on our YouTube program descriptions. And for those who are attending at the auditorium, you will find the QR code to the questionnaire located in front of the entrance. Your thoughts are very valuable for us uh, for the improvement of our future projects. And without further ado, I would like to start our first part of the program, cultural diplomacy, its concepts and interpretations in each nation. We are very much honored, at most grateful, and delighted to have many distinguished scholars and cultural practitioners from Europe, Japan, Australia, and Thailand to join our conversation today. Three of them will be joining us online from different time zones, and two of them will join us here at the auditorium. I would like to briefly introduce the names of our speakers for this session. First, Mr. Ronald Gratz. Second, Professor Dr. Shibasaki Atsushi, Dr. Sin Gu, Associate Professor Dr. Kitty Presasuk, and Associate Professor Dr. Nathanan Kunaman. The first presentation of this session will be from Mr. Ronald Gratz, Secretary General of IFA, which in English is the Institute for Foreign Cultural Relations, which is the Germany's oldest intermediary organization for international and cultural re relations in Germany. Before assuming his position at IFA, he was the director of the Goethe Institute in Portugal. Mr. Ronald Gratz worked as division director of German language at the UNESCO scheme Collegio Benjamin Constant in Sao Paulo, and was a consultant for new media and the director of local program activities in Eastern Europe and Central Asia at the Goethe Institute in Moscow. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Ronald Gratz. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting conference. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to, to give you some, some impressions, some informations about the, the foreign cultural policy like it uh, works in, in, in Germany. And first, I would like to, 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 ask you to, to be aware, aware that Germany has no ministry for culture and no ministry for education. That's very special because of the Second World War and our experiences with the Nazi regime. So the, the whole responsibility for education and culture is up to the regions of Germany. And after the Second World War, well, the, the, the government asked and who will represent uh, the, the German culture abroad. And so they, they decided not to give it in the hands of the government, but to, to, or, to, to organize foreign cultural policy by independent um, cultural institutes. First slide. So, 
we see the foreign cultural policy as one pillar of the foreign policy. So the one pillar is the, the diplomacy or security policy. The second one is a foreign um, economic policy. And the third one is foreign cultural and educational policy. And we, in, in our point of view, of course, the cultural relations is the basic of everything. If you can't, don't have cultural um, relations, cultural understanding, you can't um, have a good relation with other, with other countries. So foreign cultural policy is undertaken how I said, by independent educational and cultural organizations like the Goethe Institute or IFA or Deutsche Welle or DAAD or Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. So, and we, within the scope of target agreements, um, and we see ourselves as, as civil society. So that's very special. Civil society organizations are responsible for the foreign cultural policy and financed by the, by the state. So that's important as first. Well. Let's say we are arm's length institutes. Next one. Second, foreign cultural policy reflects the strategic and regional focuses and responsibilities of Germany's foreign uh, policy. Important for me in this point is to the, the word responsibility. We don't act in interest of something, we act in, with responsibility for the whole world. So not defending interests, but taking responsibility to resolve problems. And that's the way as well, I, I wrote questions of content. We see culture um, in the context, for example, of climate change, because it's our, our um, our idea of progress who creates as well climate change or the climate problems. And we reflect about culture and, and um, conflict, for, for example. Culture is one reason for conflict and culture may be as one moment to resolve conflict. So that are questions of context uh, where the culture has a certain part. That's important for us. Next one. Foreign cultural policy presents Germany. And the, the, the main point for us is the, the word partner. We look for partners. We don't export something only to show. So we are, to say the truth, a little bit um, far from, the, from, from uh, ideas of, of soft power, for example. And I prefer as well to say foreign cultural relations than foreign cultural policy, because policy means the state who, who acts. And we see ourselves close to the um, society, but far from the government. That's the way we, we think and we act. So, and, and the main point for us is to get trust, to get trust with us, between us and, and other people. And, and that's the main point. Next one. So foreign cultural policy is a dialogue within cultures, within and outside Germany. Um, we have to be, to be, to be careful to, to use the, the, the word culture in our point of view, um, uh, like the word state. So we have to, 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 be, to, to, to see the difference between the, the, the items of, of culture, of identity, state, nation, nation state. But in our point of view, at least in Europe, maybe only in, in Europe, but uh, that culture means state doesn't, in my point of view, doesn't work here in Europe. Uh, and as well, culture as maybe culture, sometimes culture is nation works. But um, let's give you an example, the, the, the Spain. Spain, is Spain a state with one culture? No, it's a state with four cultures, like, like Catalonia, like, like the Basques. Um, and maybe at least a, 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 um, one state with four nations, yeah? So we have to, to see this difference um, to, to, to see what is the important point in cultural relations and in cultural dialogue. Next one. Foreign cultural policy sees itself at the presentation and dissemination of culture from Germany abroad and also equally as a two-way street. So for us, the foreign cultural policy is as well, or relations as well, space, space of learning. And we have to bring back to our society what we learned in the dialogue, in the cultural dialogue 
uh, outside Germany to bring it back to our society for them to learn how the work, world thinks and acts and what are the, 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 the different point of views to the things. So we think cultural policy is a space of learning. Next one. Foreign cultural policy is committed to the values of democracy, human rights, freedom of opinion, freedom of art and science, peace and environmental protection. So it's very basic point of, of us to say all the cultures in the world are equal of equal value. But there are some contradictions as well. You have to see, for example, female genital uh, mutilation in that culture, in our point of view, it's crime because it's against the human rights. And human rights, uh, the declaration of the human rights, that's for us the, the point of reference for everything we do. We believe that this is what the world, the world makes better and that is good definition for, or a good criteria for what as well as culture and what is not culture, but only criminal or, or out of, of ethics. Next one. Foreign cultural policy provides information about culture in and from Germany. That's um, important for us because we never speak about um, German art. We speak always about art from Germany. My institute, where I'm working in, the Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, it's an institute for foreign cultural relations like the Goethe Institute. We organize exhibitions with art from contemporary art from Germany. That means in these exhibitions are artists as well from Bolivia, from Turkey, from China, from um, Iran, who are living in Germany. So Germany is the, the, the society of reference for their work. And so it's for us, it's art from Germany. And we show art from Germany as well, of course, German artists, but we have a huge difficulty to, to define what is German art. Not at least the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. Is that German music? No, it's a, it's a, it's a miracle for the world, yeah? This, this kind of music, and it belongs to the world. It's not belongs, doesn't belong to, to Germany. Next one. Foreign cultural policy is based on dialogue and on process. That's it as well. As, as well, in the in the last let's say in the last ten years, the, the the way of our intercultural dialogue changed. First, we always spoke about dialogue. That means, for example, the the with, with art exhibitions. Uh, well, we made an exhibition, we curated the exhibition, and we showed the exhibition outside Germany. And then we spoke about uh, well, dialogue is not it's not enough. We have to make better um, corporations. And so we looked for, for uh, our um, exhibitions to be completed by other exhibitions where we showed. Let's say we showed in, in, in Australia. So we asked our partners in Australia to put as well uh, artists from Australia to, to have a common exhibition. And now we speak about um, <clears throat> co-production. That means be before we make an exhibition, we invite up to 10, 12 curators from around the world, from China, South Africa, Brazil, Northern America, or from, from Norway, and uh, to come to Germany and to, to discuss what kind of exhibition would make sense in the, the, the context of um, cultural relations and cultural dialogue. And that is our way we are working now. Um, uh, we, and we call it from dialogue to cooperation to co-production. Next one. Foreign cultural policy thinks and acts in networks. That's important because, well, in, in Europe, you have to, to, to think always in networks. Um, and so the, the community building, as well in, in uh, the, the empowerment of, 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 our, of people, of, of our partners, it's important for us. For example, a very important network for us is UNIC. That's the European National Institutes for Culture. It's a network with all the cultural institutes from Europe, like British Council, Institut Francais, uh, Institut Cervantes, Institut de Dante Alighieri, and so on. That's a very important network uh, for us, and we are working with them together. Um, and that means as well, we feel in a certain way as well as an European cultural institute from Germany. Yeah. 
um, not only German isolated <laughs> institute, but that's as well the, the, the thinking of responsibility, not only interest. Next one. Foreign culture policy is focused on media. Of course, the, the digital transformation um, is important for us as well because of Corona, because of the, the world uh, changing. Um, and we, we have to see how we not only utilize the, the, the digitalization, but how we create spaces, platforms. But finally, intercultural relations, intercultural dialogue works when you bring people together. You can't create trust via Zoom. I'm completely convinced that um, we can't stop to, to, to bring people together to travel and to meet another, yeah? That's the, the, the cost. Cultural relations need as well to, to influence, to, yeah, to, to motivate people to think about things, yeah? And that's better to do it um, face by face. Next one. The target groups of foreign cultural policy, well, there are some, some doubts now. Um, well, normally we always sp spoke about decision makers, the young elites in politics, culture, and the economy, the civil society protagonists. I think as well, we should think in, in the people outside the, the capitals or the, 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 the very big cities. And when one, um, well, we are thinking about, right? It's our, our um, it's not ready the, the, the concept, but as well, children, women, and teachers are very important target groups. Yeah. Um, so, okay, next one. The foreign cultural policy is aware of our historical responsibility for national national socialism and the horrific crimes. And then that means, and that's the last point for me, that we see cultural relations, cultural dialogue, cultural understanding in, in the, the aim to create peace. And so I think cultural dialogue is peace building, is peace keeping, is conflict treatment. And well, in this, in this sense, I think the cultural dialogue is not only to show some, some artists, it has a um, broader sense and we need, because of that, because of peace and to create peace in the world, the cultural dialogue and understanding. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to Mr. Rano Graz for his clear and insightful presentation about the foreign cultural policy in the context of Germany. Next, I would like to introduce our next speaker for the next presentation is Dr. Sin Gu, Senior Lecturer, School of Media, Film and Journalism of the Monash University, Australia. Dr. Sin Gu is an expert appointed by UNESCO 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of Expression of Cultural Diversity from 2019 to 2022. She was the Director of the Master of Cultural and Creative Industries, or MCCI, at Monash University in Australia from 2018 to 2019, and has published widely on urban creative clusters and agglomerations, cultural work, creative entrepreneurship, cultural and creative un industries policy, media cities, maker culture, and cyber culture. Please welcome, live from Australia, to the stage, Dr. Singu. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And good afternoon from Australia. It's my pleasure to be part of this very important and timely conversation about culture diplomacy. I think in light of current uh, geopolitical tensions um, in recent years, Chinese culture diplomacy has taken on really new meanings um, through a reimagining of the Chinese public at home and abroad. So my talk today will explore the emergent discourses and practices of Chinese culture diplomacy. Next slide, please. So I think many countries these days use soft power as a key approach in culture diplomacy. 
but the two are fundamentally different. As some have argued that soft power is very much an American articulation driven by the large volume of cultural products the US exports globally, embedded in the global reach of American inflected culture consumption. It promises American influence globally through the de deployment of its neoliberal um, ideology. Following on from this understanding, it's important for us to establish that culture attractiveness is not soft power. It is clearly a soft power source, as some have argued. However, neither the government nor any of the culture agencies can be defined as a form of soft power. And this has implications on some of the not so successful attempts by Chinese government and associated agencies trying to deploy Chinese soft power overseas, as I will discuss later. Next one, please. And culture as a source for Chinese soft, uh, soft power has only emerged quite recently, as some have observed. However, instead of building on contemporary culture understandings, the Chinese government has decided to reappropriate Confucian, uh, Confucianism, prioritizing collective cultural rights over individual rights. This has become a main reference point for understanding the characteristics of Chinese culture diplomacy, as we've seen in events such as the Beijing Olympics. Soft power enters uh, the realm of Chinese public diplomacy from uh, very much around 2000, uh, recognized by the leadership as an important framework to advance China's interests overseas. And this represents a particular challenge for culture diplomacy. At the very heart of this challenge, as I see it, is the disconnectedness uh, between traditional culture diplomacy practices, drawing very much the inspirations from uh, Confucianism and contemporary Chinese culture industries influenced in large parts by Western popular culture. Next one, please. So why Confucianism occupies such an important place in Chinese culture diplomacy? This is a very complex question. Melissa argues that soft power in East Asia is always relational and is based on shared values and multilateral approach and regional roles. Chinese approach to culture diplomacy therefore shares very similar characteristics to its Eastern Asian neighbors, including Japan and Korea. On top of culture being a means to project a positive image of China for international audience, for China, culture is also seen as a very important source for defending and legitimizing the one party rule, which is a matter of culture security. Unlike the US, Chinese perception of soft power is concerned with domestic culture cohesion and is implemented outside China under the rhetoric of international harmony. The latter derives very much from a deep-seated government anxiety over the China threat theory. Soft power, therefore, in China has become less a conversation about China or what China is or should be perceived by international audience, and more often a domestic debate about China's national culture identity and its relationship to Communist Party. And this represents unique opportunity and challenges for Chinese culture diplomacy, as I will uh, talk about later. Next one, please. So let me begin with its challenges. The biggest impediment to China's culture's uh, soft power is its inability to separate its global ambition from domestic politics. Some have suggested that China's soft power strategy has achieved the opposite effect. Any Chinese company overseas runs the risk of being seen as the extension of the party's line. We've seen that happening with companies such as Huawei and TikTok. And any Chinese media organization operating outside of China were also seen as the throat and tongue of the party, even though very different journalistic practices have been incorporated. Part of the problem is that Chinese culture diplomacy has been developed as a response to Western domination of the media public sphere. Most of its approaches are seen as defensive and they serve to trigger ideological control, export communism globally that undermines the credibility of some of these attempts 
that try to develop true global engagements. So differences between China's status as an economic power and China's deficit in soft power has become new source of anxiety amongst the political class. Uh, some believe that such tension manifests itself in the media sphere in forms of three key divergences in popular perception centering on how China sees itself and how the world sees China. And these can be illustrated in the ineffectiveness of its two major diplomacy strategies, the Confucius Institute and the Belt and Road Initiative. Next one, please. So, uh, so Confucius Institutes have become a major expression of China's global soft power aspirations. Despite its good will to display Chinese culture achievements, Confucius Institute is perceived by the West to be in direct tension with more grounded and realistic discussion of China's current role in the world. The Belt and Road Initiative is another example of the ineffectiveness of Chinese soft power. As Tim Winter argues, the initiative aims at reviving the idea of Silk Road is built on common history of transnational, uh, transnationalism, which is a much more powerful narrative than the American versed soft power. But this has faced resistance from competing economies in the region, including Australia. Just less than two weeks ago, Australian government has passed foreign investment legislations viewed very much as a response to veto the OBOR agreement signed between uh, Victoria government and China. Next one, please. So these tensions ask us really to take a step back in asking what might be the basis for Chinese culture diplomacy in the new era. The Chinese discourse has to date closely aligned with national interests. The agenda setting process has been one directional and state centered. Could the rise of popular forms of culture and creative industries be able to address the issue of democrat uh, democratic uh, deficit? And if so, is it in the national interest to loosen ideological control within the country? The notion of culture and creative industries in the, in the Chinese policy context since early 2000s was very much borrowed from the UK, has been very quickly appropriated by players in the, in the circuit of culture policy. There is fundamental contradiction in the Chinese use of CCI though. That is the, the foundational idea of the Asian value understood in terms of culture collectivism and the idea of the rise of culture and creative industries, which tends to prioritize individual consumers, culture consumptions and so on. So the notion of independent creatives, self-organized uh, resisting to institutionalization, which is at the core of the CCR narrative in the West, is a particular difficult policy area for China. So the question of when would be the value of a powerful national culture institute to add value to individual businesses aimed at promoting genuine individual creativity is the most important question for China. And this has certainly been a criticism directed at China's future as a creative nation, very much equating China's creative deficit to the country's democracy deficit. On the other hand, these generalizations regarding China's lack of ability to compete at a human, humanistic individual scale has not taken into account, I think, of the different translation of CCR policy in China nor did they register the societal transformation brought by it. I think two tendencies are worthy of our attention here. Next one, please. So the, uh, the instrumental use of culture overseas to legitimize the modern communist state certainly hasn't disappeared as a powerful shaping uh, imperative. But this is much less the case uh, in, uh, in, the, in the field of popular culture industries. This is very much um, evident in the rise of hip hop culture in the country. Um, writing for the BBC, um, Liu argued that many of the China's best known rappers have uh, chosen to side with their nationalistic pride rather than challenging the establishment. Hi Brother, the most well-known hip hop troupe from Sichuan in China has become successful both at home and internationally. 
But in the last few years, these popular culture forms have begun to appropriate a political tone in their creation amidst greater geopolitical tensions. And these voices are freely circulating in the Chinese media sphere and are seen as authentic outside of China because they're raising the fundamental question about youth identity of what, this, uh, what it means to be Chinese in contemporary society. At a moment in history when identifying Chineseness has constantly been contested, hip hop has become an official culture diplomacy tool when it began to, to be organized around a binary of love China or hate China, as one rapper famously declared, once again, I'm proud to be Chinese on his Instagram post. The endorsement of hip hop by state media is an indication of the appropriation of the popularist narrative. Uh, next one, please. The attempt to dominate and build China's power internationally and to tell the China story from the Chinese perspective is still a key pursuit of Chinese culture diplomacy. However, what many Western media fail to register is that this is a response driven by the Chinese public as much as by a top-down uh, desire um, coming out from the government. This is the case of the rise of maker culture in the city of Shenzhen in South China. In 2008, a techno culture phenomenon emerged in China, gaining wide popularity. Shenzhai, a way of reappropriating product ideas for local users. According to uh, scholar Andrew Chop, Shanghai's wide appeal as an emerging form of maker movement in China evokes um, Chineseness, marginality, and independence, playfulness, and critique. It designates to a group of creative entrepreneurs who operate outside of the authoritarian control of culture production. It has become a philosophical term denoting a Chinese style of innovation with a peasant mindset. Uh, mindset. Shanghai's cool DIY spirit has a nationalistic pride, but it is also rooted in the strength of the state, but in the flexible creative culture of the street. Western media were quick to celebrate this ingenious um, Chineseness. The Wild magazine has produced a documentary labeling Shenzhen as the Silicon Valley of hardware, without mentioning how these are actually linked to Chinese government's Made in China 2025 strategy. Next one, please. So to conclude, these are important popularist imperatives shaping Chinese culture policy. They are articulating a new discourse of Chinese identity alongside traditional culture diplomacy approaches. In our book, uh, Red Creative, which has just come out this year, uh, we argue that it works in China, China's national interest to loosen some ideological control in the culture sphere because it prioritized empathy and mutuality, which are core to China's interest in the new global era. However, this requires the Chinese government to walk on a tight rope between individualistic and collective social values and a genuine respect for differences across countries with the commitment to deep, deepen dialogue of the common goods for all. Um, that's it from me, thank you very much. Thank you very much, very much to Dr. Sin Gu for the pre very interesting presentation. Um, very insightful and interesting points on um, the Chinese cultural diplomacy and cultural movements in the contemporary times. We will indeed invite her back and of course with Mr. Ronald Glatz to join further conversations about those topics. But before that, please allow me to present and welcome our last presentation from Professor Dr. Shibasaki Atsushi. Professor Dr. Shibasaki Atsushi uh, is a lecturer in Komazawa University Faculty of Global Media Studies. He is an expert of the history theory and philosophy of international cultural relations and international relations. His field of research varies from the history of international cultural re relations in modern Japan to the concept of soft power, concept of fear, ideas surrounding Kenneth Waltz, Immanuel Kant, Antonio Negri, and Bob Dylan. Please welcome Professor Dr. Shibasaki Atsushi. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Atsu Shibasaki from Japan, uh, Komoza University. Uh, I feel much privileged to be here on online uh, with all of you, uh, sharing our thoughts and experience together. Uh, also, I'm so happy to have a chance to uh, make my presentation about international or global culture uh, on the alleged uh, 250th birthday of Beethoven. Uh, next slide, please. Um, today, I would like to talk about a uh, brief historical development of cultural diplomacy and international cultural activities in modern and contemporary Japan and present uh, several uh, points of reference or framework, uh, if I may say so, uh, that might be useful for our discussion about international cultural activities that we engage or observe. Uh, my talk has three parts. Uh, first, I would like to show my research background very quickly. And the second, uh, also very briefly, I try to uh, give you a review about uh, historical context of Japan uh, for about 100 years uh, from early 20th century to the present. And lastly, I would like to uh, lay out some arguments which might give us uh, some clues when we explore the future role of cultural diplomacy or significance of the, the very act of promoting cultural relations itself in this globalized world. Uh, next, please. So the part one, uh, my research could be uh, divided uh, into four. Uh, part A, history is my starting point, especially uh, that of international cultural relations or cultural diplomacy in modern Japan. Uh, KBS uh, was the uh, first institution in Japan and uh, its successor is of course Japan Foundation. Uh, Japan America Student Conference is still active and uh, on the uh, one of the most famous student association in this area. Uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Kichi Miyazawa, former Prime Minister, were among its participants, uh, including myself, actually. <laughs> I deal with uh, HIF, uh, this is Hokkaido International Foundation, and the Hakone Conference uh, later. Then, uh, uh, part B, I turn to a history of thought and theory. Uh, concerning international cultural relations and uh, IA. Um, from these areas, I uh, refer Tanaka and Nai uh, later. Uh, along with that, part C, I expand my field uh, into more meta uh, metaphysical analysis of history or uh, historiography and the uh, structure of the discipline of IA. Uh, today, I pick up some arguments on uh, global relations as a, new, as a new concept or global cultural relations uh, instead of international relations or international cultural relations. Uh, lastly, uh, in the part D, I tackle with the uh, issue on cultures as follows. Uh, also, I borrow some findings from my recent study of Bob Dylan or Anthony Negri. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, those are my recent papers I interview with Anton Negri uh, while I, I was in Basel. And uh, the right side is uh, my paper, uh, the summary of the paper of Bob Dylan. Uh, next, please. Okay, let's proceed to part two. Uh, main topic uh, about the history of international cultural relations in modern Japan. Uh, this analysis came, uh, comes from one chapter of my latest book, um, my tentative uh, periodization of uh, international cultural relations in modern Japan as below, uh, I mean, four phases. Here I use the international cultural relations uh, in the broadest sense, uh, including what we call uh, uh, cultural diplomacy or public diplomacy or foreign cultural policy. Uh, I would explore the reason why I choose this word later. Then um, let's uh, review each phase. Uh, phase A, uh, 1905 to 45, is a starting point for Japan. Uh, most important keyword were two. Uh, one is uh, the convergence of Eastern Western culture or civilization by Japan. And uh, the second is the concept of national diplomacy. Uh, right after the uh, victory of uh, Russo Japanese War, uh, the former emerged as a core cultural identity of modern Japan. Uh, this is 
uh, a kind of Japanese version of uh, Mission to Civilize, Mission Civilization, uh, France, uh, which insists that uh, Japan is the only nation who can do such convergence and that their mission uh, in the world history. Of course, this is totally egocentric thought and it reflects overestimation of their ability at that time. The latter, I mean, uh, national, uh, the concept of national diplomacy was designed and uh, initiated through public institutions like KBS or IPL, Institute, Institute of Pacific Relations, or non-state initiatives, uh, including individuals uh, like Nito Inazo or others. Uh, this was uh, basically uh, tightly connected to the former ideas. Uh, Japan is a, quote, special uh, nation which has such mission, but other countries uh, don't understand or misunderstand its special position and the supremacy, uh, quote, of Japanese culture and people. So uh, they try to uh, make them understand more correctly <laughs> about the Japanese culture. Uh, so uh, those people, uh, thought that uh, we, private actor, as an agent of Japan, have to make them understand a true Japan. That was the second idea. So on uh, phase B, after the defeat of Asia-Pacific War, uh, people uh, concerning cultural exchange activities uh, try to restart its exchange programs under U.S. occupation, of course, in the war-torn Japan. Uh, they show some uh, self-criticism uh, uh, towards water and propaganda, which they had to join, or uh, self-absorption of Japanese cultural supremacy. But importantly, uh, they did not abandon the original idea of East-West convergence on the mission civilities, unfortunately. Uh, in this post-war era, uh, the main keyword was uh, mutual understanding, which shows the wish to learn foreign culture again, but the element of the wish to realize correct understanding of Japanese culture in the hearts and minds of other countries uh, still remain. Also, uh, the main target were US and Asia, especially Southeast Asia and then uh, East Asia. Uh, International House of Japan established in 1950 and Japan Foundation 1972 were uh, institutional expressions in this era. However, uh, we should not oversee the birth of non-state initiatives, uh, which try to establish transnational cultural or social relations, uh, not via governmental support by various types of actors, especially from 1970s. Uh, for those actors in this era, uh, the, main, the main keyword was internationalization. So uh, on phase C, uh, in this period, uh, we could detect uh, a kind of transition of the keywords in the field, uh, it seems to me. For example, uh, from internationalization to globalization, and from uh, mutual understanding to public diplomacy, soft power, or soft power. So those transition paved the way to phase D. Uh, another significant phenomenon was, uh, so to say, uh, there could uh, observe uh, the bipolarization of, of so-called uh, neoliberalistic state-centered trend, neoliberalistic trend, and then the civil society or people-centered trend in international cultural relations. As we are well aware of the former, but in the case of Japan, the latter has been relatively uh, overlooked, especially in the field of international cultural relations. Uh, that is why I have done such some research on HIF, uh, which was a pioneer of realizing such pro programs, uh, totally independent from state in 1979. Uh, they uh, realized a, farm, a kind of farm stay program of foreign students already arrived in Japan. And the Hakone Conference, uh, 1988 to 1997, which played a critical role of networking such initiatives in all parts of Japan. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, like a tiny version of World Social Forum, uh, including all kinds of leaders and uh, initiators on cultural exchange, uh, NGOs and uh, philanthropy and so on. Uh, also, uh, we should not forget the impact of the great earthquake in Kobe in 1995, which made people realize the importance of volunteer or social activities. 
Uh, lastly, the phase D, uh, we, uh, we might make uh, more subperiodization for those uh, this, uh, 20 years in future. Uh, but basically, this, this junction between neoliberal and civil society activities is more and more deeper uh, from my point of view. Uh, the concept of soft power, uh, which did not strongly stress the uh, uh, importance of cultural relations when it was originally invented in 1990, uh, became the buzzword from around 2003 to 2004, uh, just before the Iraq war. And as the keywords appeared in this field were mainly about neoliberalistic trend, which uh, induced all international cultural activities to serve national interests somehow, but very softly. Um, next four, three or four slides are the example of the, such kind of non-private uh, initi initiatives, initiatives in 1970s and 1980s. Uh, so please uh, go forward. Next one, and the next one. And next one, I'm going to skip the explanation. Next one, and next one. And uh, please move to the next slide, okay. Well, uh, now we step into the uh, concluding part. Uh, I have three main points uh, regarding the future of cultural relations and the uh, role of cultural diplomacy. Uh, first, A, uh, we should remind that the cultural diplomacy uh, or public diplomacy is one of the global cultural relations, not vice versa. Uh, in the academic field, there were two pioneers of, who introduced the uh, importance of culture in the study of international relations. Uh, one is Akira Ilie, a Harvard historian, and the other is uh, Kenichiro Hirano uh, in Japan. And I guess uh, rather than uh, Ilie approach, uh, Hirano approach, which is uh, interstate relations as one of the cultural relations of every kind, every actor, would be relatively more insightful uh, for us. And second, uh, seeing from such perspective, uh, there always remains uh, uh, the counter argument from mainstream IR that insisting the importance of global uh, people or civil society um, cannot overcome the basic premise of IR, such as sovereignty, anarchy, or power politics. As Ken Booth, a famous IR scholar, once wrote, even as actors and levels are important, IR scholar cannot abandon those mainstream premises and only add other factors up and put like this. Uh, states are important, but not exclusively uh, th in that way. Uh, in a sense, IR scholars still have not found a way to escape uh, this aporia. Uh, yes, uh, this is quite difficult uh, academic challenges to deal with, but if we try to see the global people-oriented approach to see the world, we could include the international into the global. And if uh, global cultural relations is what people make of it, cultural diplomacy, which is also what states make of. Uh, of course, this phrase borrowed from the Alexander Vent uh, can contribute to empower people-centered global cultural relations. Uh, next slide, please. Lastly, uh, I would like to introduce a word of Han Arendt about new beginning. Uh, I think two slides forward, maybe. Uh, two slides forward, please. Yes, uh, next one, okay, okay, yes. Uh, even uh, every cultural activity, uh, whoever planned or initiated, has a possibility to make a new beginning, uh, just like Hannah Arendt said. That was exactly uh, Kotaro Tanaka, a scholar of international law and commercial law uh, in the pre war era, uh, noticed from his one year experience in Europe in 1936 to 37. Uh, he described such phenomenon as a uh, quote, uh, true effect apart from politic intentions. A true effect apart from politic intentions. Uh, one slide backwards, please. Okay. Uh, to paraphrase uh, such a uh, concept uh, like beginning or true effect uh, in terms of international cultural activities, uh, I would like to suggest two key concepts, uh, infection and uh, compassion. The former was taken from the award of Leo Tolstoy, and the latter was from my latest book and a newly published book just published in December by officials of uh, Japan Foundation, and both of which coincidentally stress the importance of compassion. Uh, 
uh, one slide backwards, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I, I finished in one minute. Okay, one minute. So, uh, the, so the cultural diplomacy is exactly what uh, states make of it, and we have to accept its limitation, of course. But uh, cultural diplomacy is also one of the global cultural relations or phenomena, which fundamentally has the power to enrich people culturally, especially strengthening the global human chain of compassion. Uh, such global chain of compassion uh, sometimes conflicts with national interests, but does not inevitably confront them. So on the contrary, it might change the contents of national interests themselves into more peaceful ones, which fit to the concept of living together in the age of uh, so-called planetary boundary, as uh, Johann Lockstrom has pointed out. I would be glad if cultural diplomacy would contribute more to make a new beginning globally. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Shibasaki Atsushi. And thank you very much to indeed to all three distinguished speakers who presented their valuable thoughts and interesting perspectives of cultural diplomacy of each nation online. I am sure it has stimulated curiosity and also the urge to start conversations. So I now would like to introduce two other Thai professors who have joined us today here in this auditorium to share their thoughts and exchange comments with our online presenters. First off, I would like to introduce our first discussant and moderator, who is Associate Professor Dr. Kitty Prasasu, Vice Rector for Interna International Affairs, Tamasat University. Dr. Kitty received his BA from Tamasat University and an MA from KO University and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. His areas of interest include international relations in East and Southeast Asia, Japanese politics and foreign policy, and ASEAN. He served as an advisory committee for the Asia Center under the Japan Foundation, which promotes exchange between Japan and Southeast Asia, and is also a committee of the International Studies Center at the Thai Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also a former strategic committee at the Thai Ministry of Defense from 2014 until 2019. Our next discussant and moderator is Associate Professor Dr. Nathanan Gunamad, Jean Monnet Chair and Jean Monnet Modules Coordinator. Dr. Nathanan is a full-time professor and the director of the Center for European Studies and the Interdisciplinary Department of Euro European Studies Faculty of Political Science, Jolalongkorn University. She was awarded the Knight of the Academic Palm from the Pu Republic of France in 2019 and was awarded the European Union Jean Monnet Share Professorship. She was the first Thai and ASEAN to be titled this honorable professorship in 2016. Her recent works, for example, include studies and researches on political and economic transformations of Eastern European countries, particularly the former Yugoslavian countries and normative power Europe. Please welcome Professor Kitty and Professor Natanan on the stage. And I would like to give the floor to both of you for the moderation of the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for uh, our very nice MC today. Um, well, I was assigned to moderate uh, this uh, discussion session, uh, but before that, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate our all co-hosts from uh, Japan Foundation, British Council, and the Goethe in Institute in which um, I would like to say that this is a very special event because it's about culture and diplomacy, and um, these three institutions are the key of, um, how to say, the practitioners and cultural policy implementators of the key countries in this world. And uh, I would like to say that I and Professor Kitty, Professor Su, is also a kind of cultural diplomacy of spring, of fruit, because we are both um, 
Japanese government scholarship among Wushu recipients. And as we are a global citizen, we have uh, many, many identities. Professor Gee also the, um, have a kind of American culture uh, experience in his PhD, uh, his uh, doctoral ship. And also, I'm Shivening. I also got scholarship from British Council from uh, British government to study um, in the postgrad. So we the kind of um, cultural diplomacy of spring in which, uh, well, we are, um, we are the best two persons <laughs> to run this uh, discussion. Um, well, I would like to do it, uh, do it this way because um, I would like uh, to ask Professor Kitty to give uh, reflections and comments um, first for Dr. Singu and Professor uh, Asushi, because Professor Kitty is uh, East Asian specialist, and I will wrap up with uh, the comments on uh, Mr. Grass from IFA on German cultural diplomacy. So um, I think we have quite <laughs> time, <laughs> maybe, maybe 10, 15 minutes yeah, for two countries oh presenters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nathanan. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning and good evening for everyone here and online. It's my pleasure and my honor to be here with you today. I think uh, my responsibility would be to give some reflection to the three excellent and stimulating presentation. Uh, and also, I would like to add my perspective uh, from ASEAN point of view, how we see the cultural diplomacy, uh, how we see the uh, cultural engagement among uh, Japan, China, uh, and also probably Korea. Uh, Germany, uh, European is not my area of specialty, so I will focus more on, on East Asian country. But uh, having heard the three presentation, I cannot resist to give comment to, to German sure. case as well. <laughs> 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 I think there are uh, at least two common themes running throughout the three presentations. The first one is on the role of the states in cultural diplomacy, the role of states, or uh, to what extent state play a role in cultural diplomacy as being practiced by the three countries. Germany, it seems to be State, uh, state hand in cultural diplomacy seems to be uh, quite low. In terms of Japan, I characterize it as more like a moderate or medium. But for the China case, it's more like a high hand state has a high hand on uh, cultural diplomacy. And in the case of Germany, uh, it's more like cultural engagement rather than cultural policy or cultural diplomacy because the nature of the actors involved in cultural diplomacy seem to be diverse, uh, a lot more from civil society. And in terms of budget, I've heard that they more uh, not rely solely on the government. They can have uh, more diversity of funding sources. And Germany also the, uh, the pioneer, or the, in Japanese we call senpai, <laughs> in cultural adventures, cultural uh, enterprises in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia. I have heard from Goethe director today that uh, Goethe started its office uh, in, in Myanmar, uh, the, the first one in Southeast Asia as early as 1959, though it has been closed four years later until recently reopened. And Japan started the cultural enterprises, cultural exchange with the Japan Foundation when it was founded in the early 1970s. So Germany is the uh, very first country to advance uh, cultural uh, diplomacy in the region. After World War II, of course, uh, sorry, I, I, I do not have a uh, reference for British Council. British Council <laughs> probably maybe <laughs> earlier. <laughs> uh, let, let's compare to stick to the three countries first. Uh, for Japan, the role of the states, I think, is moderate, as I said earlier. Uh, I think with the Japan Foundation, of course, with the Momocho Scholarship, with ODA uh, 
uh, official development assistance combined, uh, Japan has been advancing cultural diplomacy uh, pretty well in the region. And you can see that uh, the image of anti-Japanese uh, anti-Japanese movement in the early 1970s in, in the region, in ASEAN, has been dissipated by the 1980s. So Japan was quite successful in advancing uh, cultural diplomacy, in uh, improving uh, the image of Japan as a nation. And in the case of Japan, it's very interesting that there are also multi-actors in cultural relation with Southeast Asia, not only the states, but uh, the cultural industry or the pop culture industry, they're very important, that come independently from the states. In fact, the state did not have much role in the advancement of uh, cultural industry from Japan to the region. We naturally accepted Japanese cultural uh, icon like cartoons, movie, TV series, celebs, uh, pop songs, uh, girl group, uh, boy bands. Earlier from, from, from Korea, in fact. And that come more naturally, not by the state uh, support, but the state came to be, Japanese state came to be aware of that in the early 2000s. And they initiated the Cool Japan uh, project, Cool Japan project. Now, you believe it or not, now Japan still ha uh, have uh, the minister who are assigned to be in charge of Cool Japan. Mm -hmm. Cool Japan minister. How cool is it? Very cool, right? <laughs> you have minister to take care of the Cool Japan project. And also budget also allocated in order to improve content industry and also uh, to promote uh, Japan image, branding uh, Japan in another way. That came out in the 2000s. Why? Because Japan faced new competitor in terms of cultural industry, cultural pop culture from Korea and also from, from China in terms of soft power, overall soft power and, and culture. Uh, and I'm not sure Japan is successful that much on cool Japan uh, because it needs to be uh, anchored by the private company <laughs> private industry, that, that probably more, more effective in promoting, promoting uh, pop culture. But anyhow, uh, Japan is quite successful in the region. Uh, so although we cannot give too much credit for the government, <laughs> but uh, I think Japan Foundation has done very well in cultural exchange, of course, but we have to give credit to uh, private uh, cultural industry as well from Japan. But the case of China, I think uh, China is a very good case for catching up economy, catching up powers. So they, they started late in the game. Uh, they came to proceed soft power in the region probably only 2000, less than 20 years ago. So they are new, new kids on the block. So they, they need to, uh, to the need state involvement to promote, like catching up industry in, in many countries in Japan in the post-war period, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, or China. The model called developmental state that they need a uh, state to involve, state to give funding to promote uh, a culture to other countries. And interestingly, in, in terms of uh, China censorship, censorship, as Professor ming -Gu also uh, mentioned, the creativity deficit Democracy deficit, I think, is a very, very key term. Creativity deficit in China that make cultural industry from China uh, not yet much attractive in the region. That is a key issue, I think. Uh, and also, Han Ban, the, the role of Han Ban. Han Ban is the uh, Confucian Institute. Professor Singu talk about Confucian Institute. That uh, is the arm of Ministry of Education. Uh, Han Pan is the agency under Ministry of Education, not, not Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, sometimes they advance uh, their, their projects uh, somehow mm, not in synchronized fashion with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, 
So here we, we can see that in, in the nature of actors difference. In the case of Germany, it seems to be multiple actors, diversity of actors. In Japan as well, although maybe not that diversified as uh, Germany, but Japan also has multiple actors in advancing culture into other countries. But in the case of China, uh, the, the nature of actors seem to be still limited, still limited, because the issue that uh, uh, Mr. Kratz mentioned about the uh, civil society, the nature of civil society, that this is also important. Uh, Japanese civil society came to uh, be activate in to uh, be active in the region as early as 1960 or even more than that in Salam district uh, in environmental issues. That also another important actor in promoting engagement with Japan, uh, not cultural per se, but also related to how we see Japan, how we uh, interact with Japan. Uh, the next question is on the next common theme, the last point. <laughs> uh, what would be the future of cultural diplomacy? What would be the future of uh, culture and diplomacy? I think uh, on this question, I would like to invite the three presenters to, to speak more on this because the title of this uh, session and the title of this seminar is on the relation between culture and diplomacy and also values and practices, values and practices. I, in my personal opinion, I think the good way to go for cultural diplomacy is to work toward global citizenship, global citizenship. Uh, Germany seems to be addressing the issue. Uh, they look at global issue rather than national issue. But that is possible because I think in the European Union or in Europe, they have a kind of post-nationalist culture, post-nationalist culture. They, they wage war so many times, so they learn now they have to, to, be, to live in harmony. <laughs> but in Asia, uh, nationalist culture remain prevalent, remain very strong. So when, whenever any country, China, Japan, Korea, whenever they promote their culture, cultural diplomacy, I think people in their country will ask, what would be the benefit that the country can gain? What would be the utility? Mm -hmm. So that I think cultural agency need to be responsible and accountable <laughs> to that as well. So that is the dilemma, the dilemma of uh, East Asian country in promoting uh, cultural diplomacy. So, but in, in any case, values for global citizenship, trying to work beyond national interest, beyond nationalism, I think, is the ideal. All right. Uh, okay, so maybe I end my, my comment yeah, maybe on you this can, point. Yeah, you can jump Thank in you. later. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Kitty. Um, uh, Professor Kitty um, did mention the dilemma in which um, I think it's a key concept that this event was arranged in which we need to discuss about how the role of the state and how the national interests interplay in this cultural diplomacy, right? And I think it's very important, and like Professor Kitty outlined that, it might be differentiated in individual countries, maybe state intervention in terms of public expenditure, public budget, uh, yeah, the money things, maybe a lot, and also um, influence the way cultural diplomacy or cultural activity going to be pursued in, in, in foreign countries. So I think the, the important questions that I think we, we kept asking all the time is how cultural diplomacy will be conducted for the sake of culture or cultural collaboration or cultural understanding rather than uh, for the sake of, how to say, security, national interest, or political goals, which, which is difficult. I, I think it is a very idealistic goal uh, to, to, to do that, right? And also Professor um, 
uh, as she also said that um, culture is supposed to be people make of it rather than states make of it, right? Um, if I'm not uh, wrong. And well, um, I would like to um, give my reflections on uh, swap to European side, Mr. Grace uh, from IFA, Germany. Um, I think um, you did excellent uh, outline about those German past of NSDAP or Nazism, Fascism, in which this is a kind of change German society to be a kind of denationalist, to be a po open society, to be the kind of multiculturalism. And, and, and I see that it was not only in Germany. I think it's a kind of value that was too very interacting in, in, in Europe. Also in, in, in the United Kingdom as well, even they, they, they left the EU already. But however, it's a kind of uh, try to denationalize uh, from, from that past and then um, embrace this kind of cosmopolitanism in terms of uh, culture. Um, but but I'm wondering, like, um, when when you present that uh, state and culture is different thing, um, but when other principles saying that the cultural diplomacy is supposed to uh, respond to strategic goal, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's it's a bit irritating me that when you say strategic goal and then when you get the state out of it, uh, what kind of strategy? Because it seems like. It's a kind of nationalist or national interest involves a lot, and yeah, that's my 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 reflections, and and also I would like to ask about how about the challenges in Germany of this multicultural society within, and uh, you need to have like an open border policy to refugees, so um, you have the kind of opposing stream of nationalism group of right-wing extremists or right-wing populist party uh, in the countries so in, in, in Europe overall if you want to 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 respond. So um, I think our three excellent presenters are with us here on the screen. Um, maybe Dr. Shingu would like to go first from uh, the reflections from Professor Kitty, mm -hmm. or, or, or we want to take the questions from the floor first. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Shinku, please. Do, do you want me to say something about the how how should we go forward? Um, I think that's the question, and and I, I guess we all addressed this in our presentations already. Uh, but from my perspective, really, it was very much in my subtitle, which is beyond national interest. So I think for authoritarian states, such as China, um, and many other Eastern Asian countries as well, where states play a significant domination role uh, in developing cultural diplomacy practices, I think beyond national interest, as some have written about this, beyond national interest is in the national interest because to make this strategy to work, you have to present this as a genuine, sincere uh, civil society approach about dialogue, about bottom-up grassroots engagement, right? It's also about common goods, building a relational um, dialogue with um, neighbors in the region. And so it's all about those kind of things. In essence, this is not a, a policy, as I think uh, Ronald have kind of uh, alerted us to. It, it shouldn't really be a political uh, in instrument from top down. For, for me, this should be a social construction. So it's a project about social engagement, social construction. Um, and also it's about the reimagination of a new kinds of identity, right? National identity and new kinds of understanding of what defines national interest. So in my case, the national interest should not be defined by the state. It should be a co-creation of meanings involving the civil society and various agencies working in arm's length with government in some cases, 
uh, but many of them would be non-for-profit NGOs operating um, overseas, right? So for, for China, it is really uh, will come down to these three things about beyond national interest, allowing co-creation of meanings by its citizens, and also about social construction and taking the government kind of top-down control away from these approaches, and also about a reimagination of a national interest and national uh, identity. Okay, That's all thank from me. you, Dr. Shingu. Um, maybe Professor Asushi, wanna go second after Dr. Shingu? Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, Professor uh, Kitty and Professor Tantana, thank you for uh, your brilliant comments. And as for the uh, um, dilemma between national interest and uh, uh, civil society or global citizenship uh, movement, uh, I just like what, what I have presented <laughs> in my uh, paper. Um, I think the key is still be the infections, uh, making compassion through infection in cultural activities. And uh, when we look back to this dilemma between national interest and uh, global citizenship, I think it comes from the uh, kind of uh, binary conception of those two concepts, I guess. Uh, both are exclusive. National interest uh, opposes a global civil society and global civil society opposes national interest. But as I said before, uh, every uh, uh, international cultural or global cultural activities has some elements uh, of uh, true effect apart from political uh, intentions. So if we uh, try to keep on uh, cultural activities uh, of, of whose uh, essence was um, ma making human chain of compassion through infections uh, uh, by cultural encounters. So the contents of national interest uh, might be changed, and then uh, th those uh, binary conception could be uh, changed. So that would be the key. That's a matter. That's okay. all. Thank you so much, Professor Asushi. Okay, next, Mr. Grayas, may I invite you to <laughs> reflect on. Thank you very much for your very interesting uh, comments with a lot of act aspects. And when I came to this conference, I first thought, well, the, 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 the conditions in Asia are completely different from the conditions in, in uh, Europe, for example. But I think we have a lot of in, in common. Mm -hmm. The first thing is we reflect about the role of state. And in uh, Europe, we discuss the post-nation state cultural policy, at least cultural policy. The rest I can't say, but in the cultural relations, we see that the model of the nation state from the 19th century comes to an end. Yeah? We have to think in a different way. We have to think in another way of uh, other models of networking and so on um, and we i think we we should agree as well on, on the point that the civil society always becomes more important and more powerful at least the, as well in the, the the area of social networks yeah like facebook or, or twitter and so on that's that's the, the it's a kind of dialogue between people a new kind of dialogue without at least in, 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 in Europe, um, any influence by, by, by states or by, by governments. And I think the main actors of foreign cultural policy is civil society, not only not the cultural um, dialogue, but as well, let's say, the sport clubs, the, the partnership between cities, the churches. There are a lot of actors who, have, who create our relations, our cultural relations, if I take sport and religion as well as part of cultural relation, as part of culture. And then I think we have to think about three eyes. The, the question of identity and the relation of state, culture and identity. And what creates our identity? Is it, is it I, I haven't a ready answer. Is it, I think language, traditions, maybe regional specific points, um, but with it's in my point of view, the, the, the identity is more in kind of organized solidarity of a group, yeah? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's identical with a state, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's only a region inside a state. Mm -hmm. 
And then we have to think, to think about um, the interests. And if you think, if you, if you I, I made the difference between interest and responsibility. And I prefer to speak about responsibility. That's as well the, the, the item of, of the issue of, of migration. Yeah, We have the responsibility for it. It's not a point of, of interest of the state. It's a responsibility for the world. Yeah, And we created as well in Europe all the conflicts and all the problems around the world, or let's say in Africa, because of our way of living. Yeah, We have to see that. Um, and we have to see if, if we speak about interests, we use culture as an instrument. And I think it doesn't work. I think it doesn't work. Speak with any artist about how he feels to be an instrument of, um, uh, of cultural relations or culture, foreign cultural policy. And I think as well, I, I would be interested to, to, hear about, uh, to hear from Andrew about this campaign, uh, Cool Britain, and if it worked, because I doubt a little bit that uh, after campaign, look how beautiful, how cool Britain is. Be Britain as well in the image of, of, uh, of the others became more cool, cooler than it was before. I don't, I don't believe that this kind of, of image building or nation branding works very well, at least not in the long term. Yeah? And that's why I believe more in a very open, um, discussion and to create spaces of, of, of learning all that and spaces of, of um, looking where we have interesting common questions to the world. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sinku, you want to say something? No. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add a All comment right. to yes. that term of uh, cool, cool Britain, mm -hmm. um, because I think there's a recent uh, report done uh, in the UK about the uh, systematic um, inequality, social inequality in the um, in the CCI sector. And it's in fact being identified, CCR has been identified as the most unequal, one of the most unequal industries in the UK in terms of the the kind of people going into the industry, the gender inequality, um, the kinds of you know middle class and upper class people more likely to get job in organizations like BBC. So I think Cool Britain is, as Ronald said, as culture being used instrumentally to promote the image of a country, clearly has worked and not worked in certain ways. But I think the bigger damage is actually um, the use of creative industries to promote economic gain uh, for, um, for certain class or certain industries, uh, which has diminished the other values of culture. And I think globally, there's this trend towards the revaluation of culture values beyond the term creative industries, you know, uh, we have really seen uh, through the COVID lockdown how culture CCR have been really in large, um, you know, deprived status and artists can't really make income from what they do. There's very limited uh, support to the culture sector in Australia, for instance. So, you know, during good times, we look at CCI, use them as you know, a culture branding or nation branding, but when they're in need in times like this, there's nothing to be thrown at them. And, and the reason is, as we've talked about today, you know, culture is beyond the economic outputs. Culture is a way of life, you know, so we need to respect to that. And we need to uh, really embark on a new project, I think, about the revaluation of culture values. Okay, um, thank you so much for our three presenters, but um, you're still with us because we have the questions uh, from the floor and online. Um, okay, I hand over to I actually have one question from, from the on online audience. And also, uh, because this is now the Q&A session, uh, if you have questions here, please feel free to raise your hand and we pass you the mic. Uh, but before that, uh, 
Before that, I have one question from, from the online audience, and this is from uh, Kun Febridia Setio Devi. I'm so sorry if I butchered your name from Indonesia. Um, and this might be something that uh, Professor Shibasaki has already covered in terms of compassion and kyokang, is that uh, the question is, how do you see foreign cultural policy as means to enhance peace, or at the minimum, be the forefront as a strategic engine of avoiding the clash of culture? And this is, this question is to everybody, yeah. Maybe Professor Asushi. Okay, uh, okay. Thank you for the question. Um, and uh, this is very, very good question. So good question means uh, it's very difficult to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, in uh, theory, uh, every cultural contact has, uh, you know, not, not uh, basically peaceful. So every cultural contact has conflicts. And uh, um, I, I, as many of us uh, experienced, when we encounter the new cultural elements at first, uh, the attitude might be too so to accept it very gladly or to reject it yeah. so uh, it, there's always uh, such kind of uh, battle between uh, one's minds and of course uh, we don't have to uh, enforce any kinds of uh, other cultural elements to anybody but it depends on the one's individuals uh, like or ability or those kind of uh, many many factors so uh, in theor theoretically, so any cultural contact does not always mean to lead any peace or uh, those kind of positive uh, direction. That, in, in that sense, you are quite right. So it is uh, very difficult. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an observer of international cultural relations, but maybe uh, uh, Mr. Gates, uh, who was a practitioner <laughs> about this uh, kind of phenomenon, so he might have the uh, more correct answer <laughs> from this question. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Asushi. Maybe uh, Mr. Grass and other things who want to respond to culture and peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only one very quick answer. I think, um, what, is the, what is the cultural dialogue about? It's about understanding, to create a space for understanding, for dialogue, for speaking together, to respect the other opinions, and to see what are the differences to agree in disagreements, and to, but to respect and to be interested in the, to create a space of interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, for other opinions uh, and so on. And, and I think that it's, it's a way to create peace because you, if you know someone, the probability to, 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 to see him as an enemy is, is less than if you know someone, as well if the, the, the other one is completely different. Yeah? Um, and if you be aware that the, the normal kind of communication um, in the dialogue as well, in the intercultural dialogue. The normal kind of communication is the misunderstanding. And if you know that the mis this, <laughs> that you are in a space of misunderstandings, then you have the, the, the maybe you are motivated to understand the other one a little bit better, yeah? And that creates peace, uh, I think. Um, well, that's, that's enough. Okay, thank you, Mr. Grace. Dr. Thinku? Um, I, I, this is just my view. I, th I think culture diplomacy has its limit. It can play a complementary role to other diplomatic uh, practices, but if two countries aren't really having a dialogue, uh, culture diplomacy can do very little. That's just my view. <laughs> no, I agree completely. You can't dance for peace. Uh, if someone wants to shoot another one, so he will do. But we can create the spaces to, to avoid that, maybe a little bit. Yes, sure. Um, thank you so thank you. much. Thank you so much. Question from the oh, auditorium. Yeah, maybe from the floor too. And if there are more questions from, from, from home, please feel free to drop it on the chat box. And I think the issue of cool Britain will be carried out in the next session because we have our <laughs> British Council director here in the next session as well. <laughs> While we are waiting for questions, may I 
interview uh, yeah, sure. a little bit on the I think the direction or the future of culture and diplomacy seem to be agreed upon by the three presenter and also the, the discussions. Mm -hmm. But I think the key question is how to convince the government of each country, particularly in East Asia, how to liberalize cultural endeavor mm -hmm. rather than state control or reoriented reorient toward uh, national interests. I think that is the, the key question. And how to convince the state, how to convince the government, maybe not enough. How to convince the people, because the basis of nationalism comes from the people, not from the state per se. So I think that is the key question that we need to tackle and to deal with, to cope with in Asia in particular. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for your comments. Um, given the pandemic is sort of raging around the world now, it's nice to see a group of people from around the world discussing something more positive. Um, my question would be, um, how do you see the role of uh, the individual State Departments and consulates in promoting cultural dialogue? Are, are, do you feel your individual countries are getting enough support, or obviously there's probably more to be done? Um, do you have any suggestions, or uh, given the BACC um, is, has an exhibit of Ai Weiwei here now, and uh, the Bangkok Art Biennale is on, um, do you see these things as valuable, and is there a way to get higher visibility for culture as a means of communication and dialogue? Thank you so much for your interesting question. About state agency. Um, who want to go first? <laughs> Everybody is I'll, I'll go first <laughs> if you want. So the same group um, first. <laughs> I, I I appreciate the question, and I think that's what the conference is about in some ways, to understand the role of these um, international agencies that are working at arm's length um, mm -hmm. with governments trying to promote uh, national interests in a very different uh, social political contexts. Um, I, I'm a s sincere believer in the role of the state. I don't think the role of the state uh, should be um, you know, axed in these kind of international exchanges. I, I actually think that the, the Chinese, the success of Chinese CCIs to some extent, owing very much to the promotion of by the government, investment in infrastructure projects, investment in building international networks and um, people to people links as well. So I think for me, the role of these um, overseas agencies uh, will always be there as long as the state is there and also having a cohesive culture policy um, that these agencies can operate under. I think sometimes it creates a bit of tension when the state has certain kind of culture policy organized around national interests and then the agencies operating outside of the national boundaries began to develop people to people links and started to change that direction of the national interest. That happens a lot and creates lots of tension. So I think for me, there's always going to be roles and space for them to operate. It's actually about how do you, um, how do you write your brief of your job when you're operating those sort of, sort of spaces? And I think it, it would be great to just give them the freedom these agencies the freedom to actually develop and develop that people to people links and empower the local voices within the context where they're operating and that's really should be the value of these agencies because they're not just intelligence agencies they're actually knowledge agencies and culture agencies mm -hmm. they're not just representing their national interests they're actually making sense of the um the other nations um, for for the national um, bodies uh, of what and how they should engage with other culture. So I think, yeah, I, I, I really think we should have more of these agencies, um, but the way they operate should be a bit more open 
and a bit more uh, locally driven rather than driven by their remote home states. And also, I think they should be brought in um, more in dialogue and conversation uh, about what that national interest should be, rather than just uh, intelligence office officers collecting information about the other nations. Yeah, it's very interesting for Dr. Singu that uh, national interest national interests need to be bottom up, and also this kind of agency is not the problem by themselves. I mean, but the way they operate is is is, is important and beneficial for conducting cultural diplomacy. Um, Mr. Grace, do you want to respond to? Yes, I, I think Germany, like like a lot of other um, European countries, mm -hmm. we have the, the network of the, the, the cultural institutes, like the Goethe Institute in, in Bangkok as well. Mm -hmm. And they are organized uh, regionally. Um, so there is a group of institutes for one region, but they are um, locally driven in the, the, the way they, they act, for example, in, in Bangkok. Yeah. Um, and, um, because that's the only, the only way to, to create um, a, a really a good, a good dialogue, I'll just say, um, to, 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 to learn. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's not the only network. There are a lot of net German uh, networks of German cultural institutions and scientific institutions like the AAD and, and so on. Um, and that's that's the way to to to, to create good people by people uh, contact in these countries um, and to react to the local um, conditions or what is the main what are the main interests or the main issues for this country or for this city. Uh, what is interesting to to discuss um, in together? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Grace. Um, Professor Asushi, I think we are in the right time now, okay? To be, okay. Um, yes. uh, thank you for your question. The, okay. uh, the first time I uh, visited Southeast Asia was 1997, and uh, I visited four countries in 10 days <laughs> to meet people. And, uh, um, and my, uh, another aim of my research was uh, to visit uh, each uh, cultural center in Jakarta or Bangkok or Kuala Lumpur and so on, uh, of course, run by uh, J Japan Foundation. And uh, that was uh, a totally surprise for me to how those uh, cultural center works and uh, try to reach uh, local people uh, in each region. So, and uh, I, I think the Kitty, I think Kitty Sensei might be <laughs> more uh, good, uh, might have more good answer about this question. And uh, as in case, in the case of Japan, I think, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, those uh, regional uh, cultural network had contributed uh, to promote uh, mutual cultural understanding. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so everybody. Much. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, I think due to time limitations, okay, one last question from over there. Uh, my, mine was more a comment uh, because we have the Bangkok Art Biennale happening now and I think that's a perfect example of cultural dialogue which is not state sponsored in any way. It's a private foundation and all the artists, Ai Weiwei from China, we have artists from Afghanistan, Kurd artists, all of whom are here on their own. We have the political protests outside. We have the COVID all around us. But in spite of all this, uh, uh, this uh, a Biennale like this is really encouraging people from al around the world for cultural dialogue, which I think is, is quite an amazing happening at this particular point of time. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, and I think we will be able to touch on that in the second part of our um, program today. But um, so again, sorry, due to time limitations, uh, we will have to end this part. Thank you to all five speakers today that have joined us um, here in the auditorium and also um, from all over the world. Um, Mr. Rano Graz.
Professor Dr. Shibasaki Atsushi, Dr. Shingu, Associate Professor Dr. Kitti Prasasuk, and Associate Professor Dr. Nathanan Gunama. Thank you very much. Please give a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so, and we will have a 15 minute break, but please don't go anywhere. Uh, we have some snacks outside. Uh, you can take a rest, and then we will be back for the second half, the round table discussions, where we see the cultural policy in action. So thank you all, and see you in a minute. In 15 minutes, actually. Yeah. Uh, so for the online speakers, may we please
back, everybody, um, for our second part of the symposium today. As we are waiting for uh, people to come in, I would just like to briefly introduce again uh, what our session will be like for, for the second half. So this is the second half of the International Public Symposium on Culture and Diplomacy in the Changing World, its relations, values, and practices. So after we have listened to many ideas of its theory, concept, and interpretation of cultural diplomacy in each nation, in the part one, we will now give all of, the, all of you the real practices of many cultural exchange projects and its modification and planning process. So I would like to introduce and welcome all five speakers on the stage. So first off, we have uh, our guest moderator, <laughs> Mr. Yoshioka Norihiko, the uh, Director General of Japan Foundation Bangkok. And then we have Ms. Sasapin Sriwani, Artistic Director of Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting, or BIPAM. We have Professor Doc Dr. Apinan Posyanan, former Permanent Secretary of Ministry of Culture, now CEO and Artistic Director of Bangkok Art Benali 2020, Thailand. And then next, we have Ms. Maren Niemeyer, Director of the Goethe Institute, Thailand, and Mr. Andrew Glass, Country Director of the British Council, Thailand. Welcome, everybody. And I will now like to pass on the mic to our moderator for today, Mr. Yoshioka. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Wan. And so today I will be the moderator for this mm -hmm. part two sessions. And uh, to we have uh, four uh, honorable speakers today. And uh, I will divide the questions into two parts. First will be the questions to directors of Cultural Health Institute, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Ms. Maren and uh, <coughs> Mr. Andrew. And then next will be the questions to Dr. Apinan and Kun Satapim. And later we will have more dialogues together in the, in the latter part. So firstly, <coughs> I would like to ask uh, Ms. Marin and Mr. Andrew about your institute or your organization. Mm -hmm. uh, my question and my point has uh, three points, basically, and I, I try to merge into, into one question. Mm -hmm. So please uh, answer to me by, by one by one. Uh, but first point is, uh, what is your mission uh, as a British Council and the Getty Institute? And I understand that uh, each institute uh, seems to have a favorable term, how to how to how to call your activity? Mm -hmm. I think the British Council is more prefer to use cultural relations, while Case Institute often use uh, cultural cooperation. I think, and in the case of the Japan Foundation, we often use the cultural exchange as a term. So maybe it might be related to your mission as well. So if it is related, please mention about it too. Okay. And the second point is uh, when we say uh, cultural organizations, even we say the same term using culture. I think the range of culture we, we cover mm -hmm. s seem to be different by each institute. Uh, as far as I know, the British Council also uh, covers science as well right. in, in yeah. your culture, but mm -hmm. in case of uh, Japan, Japan Foundation, we, don't, we, don't, we cannot cover science because of our, our capacity mm -hmm. and uh, some kind of things. So second point is uh, what do I include or exclude in your cultural activities? And do you have any, how to say, shift or change over the decades that when you say culture, you have any different mm -hmm. focus or something is newly included or something is newly excluded? This is the second point. And the third point is uh, uh, about your organization's overall direction. I think the mission is the same. I think this is uh, stipulated by the law or the government. But uh, direction or uh, policy for planning for each project might be somehow dif somehow shifted or changed over the decade. And I want to know if it, there is such shift or changes. What were such changes and what was the reason behind why you change your focus or direction in the past decade? So these three points I want to ask to, uh, to your view. And firstly, uh, may I uh, invite Mr. Andrew to, to talk about British Council? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody, and good evening to people in Japan. Um, I've done a, I prepared a short yeah. presentation in which I, I think I tackle all your questions, but if there's anything I've missed, you can, <laughs> you can come okay. back to me afterwards. Um, I was struck when I was listening to the presentations before, um, particularly Roland's. 
And I was jotting down some of the words he was saying. Um, arm's length, partners, partnership, trust, <coughs> two-way street, learning, uh, talking about target audiences, thinking outside traditional elites, thinking outside the capitals. And I was beginning to think my presentation was redundant because he'd, <laughs> he'd said everything already about <laughs> cultural relations as, as we understand it. And I think a lot of similarities between um, his depiction of cultural relations and how I understand it on behalf of the British Council. Just, um, I think probably most of you know of the British Council. You may have had some contact, but just in case anybody hasn't. Uh, we were founded in the United Kingdom in 1934, <laughs> which makes us 86 years old now. Um, our first overseas office was 1938 or 39, and the first ones were in places such as um, Egypt, Bucharest, Athens. Um, we are an arm's length body. Um, we are f partly funded by the British Ministry of Foreign and Development Affairs. Um, about 12% of our funding comes from the UK government. 88% is from, from other sources, earned income. Um, and our definition is on, our mission, sorry, is on the following slide. The British Council builds connections, understanding, and trust between people in the UK and other countries through arts and culture, education and the English language. Just like to pick out a few things from that. Um, at the end of the sentence it says that there is a focus. Arts and culture, education, and under education we broadly understand scientific collaboration as well, and the English language. Um, so that explains, if you like, the focus but also the breadth of our, of our work. Um, we mentioned trust between people we could also, also say peoples, I think, but um, the statement says people. So it's not just, it's people to people, it's institution, it's to institution, which in turn feeds into country to country, if you like. And then connections, understanding, and trust, and I think it's very similar to has been said already this afternoon. Um, if you connect, for example, two artists, two young artists, emerging artists, or um, researchers in their early stage of their career. If you put them together because they have, if you put a Thai researcher and a British researcher together because they have particular interests in whether it's sustainable agriculture or something related to climate change or something related to fighting malaria, um, they have shared interests. You put them in contact, they develop those interests, they start to understand each other's agendas, where one, th one person has more to offer in one area, more person has one, something to offer more in another area. They work together and through that, those connections, leading to understanding, and then it leads to trust. So I think, yeah, we want to continue working together. We trust each other. We can rely on each other. We can depend on each other. And hopefully those relations will last many years. You know, I've met, I've met people in my time in Bangkok who had their first interaction with British Council something like 40 years ago. And at different stages of their careers and professional lives, they've come in touch again. And I think that's really a proof of, one proof of success. Um, this slide touches on, again, on a lot of things discussed already. And this is a schematic which our um, head office produced a couple of years ago. And where do cultural relations fit amongst different types of relations between countries or, or between institutions? Um, and at the top right, you have hard power, which I think we're probably, probably not talking about today. Military action, sanctions, coercion. And then along the top there, you've got soft power, which has been mentioned. Um, and different elements of soft power from, say, aid development. And I think aid more in the sense of sort of infrastructure, medical aid or something, uh, towards language education skills, exchange, broadcasting, messaging, advocacy. Um, and then at the bottom, we've attempted to describe how we see um, cultural relations fitting a lot ac across this dimension. We also put cultural diplomacy, traditional diplomacy, defense engagement. And I think these things should never be seen as you know, totally black and white or rigid definitions, but it's giving a broad picture of the areas we work in. So it's access to opportunity um, in language, in education, in skills. 
It's about exchange, in cult I mentioned scientific exchange before. It could be exchange between artists, between universities. Um, and a, a part of it is about promotion, I guess, promotion of a, UK, of a country's study opportunities, a um, certain amount of broadcasting, perhaps, particularly digital nowadays. And those are the broad areas that, that we focus on. Coming back again, and I don't want to labor this because I do want to come to some of the kind of pr the practical projects we've been working on. Soft power, um, ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payments. It arises from the attractiveness of a country's culture, political ideals, and policies. Um, and I see that in a way, to put it in really simple languages, I want you to like me. When a country's thinking about soft power, I want you to like my country. I want, you know, somebody from another country wants them to like their country. Cultural relations contributes to it, but is subtly different, and I think importantly different. So the relations contribute to soft power in the end, um, but, but they're focused on people liking, understanding, respecting, valuing, trusting each other. So generally, if you understand, like, value, trust somebody, they'll probably also like you. So I don't want to s talk, say it's instrumental, but it's just, say, it's just trying to make the point how cultural relations is a contributor to that. And I think sometimes, interestingly, in the British Council at the moment with, uh, with, with our own government, they talk a lot about soft power, and we like to say, yes, we contribute to that, but through our cultural relations approach, which is very specific. What we do and how that has changed over the decades. As I said, 86 years old, and the language has changed a lot. Um, our mission in our original charter in the 1930s, English, arts, education, how we label things, of course, has changed, uh, probably like most institutions. But those three, f those three core areas, are, that's, that's what we do. In the past, I think, um, and even, you know, I've worked almost 30 years for the British Council. We've been seen as a funding agency, even though we're not and never have been, but we have often been perceived as a funding agency. And we, folk, we worked in what, in fairly traditional ways, a lot of events, if you like. Um, we were very well known for about the first probably 70 years of our existence, 60, 70 years of our existence for libraries. Um, and all that was very valid and very important at the time. You know, I worked, I worked in um, Serbia in the early two, 2000s. Um, Serbia had just come out of the wars in former Yugoslavia. And our library there was, was not really a place for people to read books or borrow videos. It was really a place for like-minded people to come together uh, who were interested in foreign cultures, interested in dialogue. And that was much more important than the, the, the books they could perhaps borrow. Um, present now, we're focusing much more on, on mutual agendas. So what is, what is relevant to the UK? What is relevant to the country we're working in? So in our, in our strategy in Thailand, for example, over the last four years, we've tried to narrow down what areas has the British Council got to offer which can be beneficial to Thailand and at the same time beneficial to the UK. And we sort of looked at the bigger political agendas, economic ag agendas, such as Thailand 4.0 and areas of inequality, and focused very much on, on sort of skills, on English, on internationalization. And at the same time, what is the UK's interest in this part of the world? I mean, we're seeing at the moment the UK having an Indo-Pacific tilt, where it's, it's turning toward, it's showing more interest, perhaps, in this part of the world than it had previously shown. Uh, the global Britain uh, agenda, as is commonly as is commonly called, you know, our cultural institu our cultural in, um, institutions, our universities want to internationalise more. How can we so how can we put those together to to create uh, programmes which are relevant to both countries? And part of that is very much about partnerships uh, and and innovation. Audiences, I mean, picking upon Ronald's point, yes, often the future generation. For example, early career researchers, emerging artists. But of course, we work through, we work with the authority generation or, or leaders. 
uh, sometimes to reach those audiences. And of course, we, we have to invest our, our resources where they can most make a difference. A couple of pictures. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see this. Uh, this was an exhibition of prison products held at the British Council in October 1974 in Siam Square. <laughs> uh, quite what we were doing in that project and what we were seeking to achieve, I'm not sure. We don't <laughs> <laughs> Our archives are not as good as they could be. So we have a picture, but we, we, we can't say more. Uh, and then, um, again, if you like a more picture of a more traditional work of a, of a cultural institute, the Shakespeare group came to give three performances in December, I think it was 70, 76. Um, contrast that to three projects we've done in, in uh, over the last four or five years. Um, our focus has been on, our, our three areas of focus have been on raising levels of English, internationalizing higher education and science, and the first two pictures show that. And the third one on be building a creative economy. Let me just focus a little bit on the, the third picture. Um, this is about a project we have worked on for something like three years with a range of different partners. Um, we've worked with Chiang Mai University. We've worked with Manchester Met Metropolitan University. Um, we've worked with a group of weavers, or, of mainly women weavers, in the province of Nan. And we've worked with some young designers in Bangkok. So, th so through the British Council's intervention, we've brought these different people together um, to create a shared agenda and to create an exchange whereby uh, um, I have colleagues in the room who can tell the story much better than I can. But essentially, um, the weavers who were making fairly traditional products, if you like, which were not, they were not selling them. They were not really helping them make a, live, a, a, good, li a good living. Uh, we've worked with them to enhance their traditional designs, match those to look at where they've had really good use of traditional materials, traditional designs, map that to, to design work done in the UK, done by the young designers in Bangkok, um, brought in training in areas such as marketing, social enterprise to help them add value to their products, if you like, and develop their communities, encourage more people to stay in the villages. We've seen that with other projects and crafts we've done. We're taking it forward now digitally, and I'd like to come back, if we can, at some stage to, you know, can digital cultural di relations work uh, or not? I, mean, I think they can, but it'll be a good one to discuss with the, with the panel. Um, we've created a digital uh, craft toolkit, which people can access on their phone. So people working in crafts can learn how to set about setting up a business, setting up a social enterprise to develop their work, how to design more effectively. It's now available, I think, in 14, 12 or 14 countries uh, and uh, in eight different languages so far. So what difference does cultural relations make and, and why does it matter? I think we've talked about it today, all ass assuming it's important and saying it's important, but just a little bit of evidence, perhaps. Um, it, you possibly can't see the details here, but this is a survey we did with a number of countries, um, including Japan, including Germany, um, on the difference in people's perceptions of the UK based on whether they've had any involvement in cultural relations or, or not. So, for example, people who have not been to the UK have 49% levels of trust. Um, people who have been involved in some sort of cultural relations or exchange, 64%. And people who have been involved in, in activities with the British Council have a 75% level, levels of, of trust. This is just one survey, but it, it begins to show how trust can, um, how can be measured. And the next one is, and what does that trust lead to? You know, Roland, Roland mentioned that it can lead to peace, and, that, and I, think, I think it can. Um, but these specific examples were a greater likelihood of doing, of trading, of studying, engaging in education partnerships, um, create cooperating in culture and arts, and even in visiting the country because you see it as more attractive, you, you have a greater affinity towards the country, you, you're more likely to want to visit it. So this is a fairly quick whip through, I think, of, of our mission how we've changed, 
what we're trying to do and how we see cultural relations. I hope, I hope, that's, uh, I hope you found that interesting and look forward to any questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want um, to take there? Okay. okay, I have some questions to Andrew, but first, go to Ms. Marin first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Savalika, hello, good evening, guten Abend, uh, guten Nachmittag, <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, the Japan Foundation and also our other partners in um, uh, Bangkok Art Biennale, the BACC, and also the British Council for inviting us as a partner. I think it's a very good time to discuss these important questions because we are in a really challenging period. Um, and um, my idea was just to show you, like a little wake up, in the beginning a trailer, because this year the Goethe Institute Thailand is celebrating his 60th anniversary. And yeah, we made a little, we, we made research mm -hmm. in all our archives and found some uh, nice old pictures. And then later I will explain a little bit um, and I try to answer your questions. Okay, so please roll the tape. The room and I hmm? press the button right here. Left to right hand. Yeah. Ah, okay. So for the moment. <laughs> we start soon? Uh, uh, need. Ah, yeah. okay. Here we go.
Um, yeah, this is perhaps a little, little travel back in the last 60 years and how many things changed, you can already see in the pictures. Um, I think I will, uh, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of parts from Roland and also from my uh, neighbor to the left, Andrew, um, is, I think, is already mentioned and that, uh, it's the same story with the Global Goethe Institute. So I decided perhaps to, yeah, to mention a little bit more uh, practice, uh, our practice work here in Bangkok. Um, so our mission in Thailand is still promoting German language, as you already saw, uh, cultural exchange, information about Germany, and I think since yeah, 10 or 15 years also, uh, civil society and Europe becomes more and more important. So we don't see us only as a German cultural institution, we see us also as a European cultural institution in our days. Um, in the beginning of the Goethe Institute, you saw classical music, for example, it was very important. So the Goethe Institute uh, helped to found uh, the first classical orchestra, the Pro Musica Orchestra, which is still existing in Thailand. That was the beginning. Then the next, uh, the next descent in the 70s, the independent film was very important, the experimental film. So uh, the Goethe Institute was a place for Thai people to, to get a window in the, in the f movie scene uh, outside from Hollywood or Bollywood uh, and inspired a lot of, of filmmakers and exchange between filmmakers. Then um, later on, uh, science became also for the Goethe Institute very important. We founded the first science film festival for pupils um, in the whole region. In our day, it's still existing and we have more than two million uh, viewers in the region of uh, Southeast Asia and also in Thailand, I think something like 500,000 young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea was really to, to attract them for science because it's very important for the future. Um, then also a very new field in our days is the youth, youth programs. We just started a new EU uh, tender, tender program uh, to develop youth parliaments and youth conferences in Thailand together with uh, Thai NGOs and also the Thai government because um, we think it's so important to learn from each other and mm -hmm. the EU started to, to develop these youth programs for example in Thessaloniki and Calais and now we connect these young people uh, together with Thai young mm -hmm. people yeah, to start to be to build democratic structures, mm. and um, that's I mean, these people are the future. These young people, and uh, we want to help them and mm. to be a platform. Um, then another very new point is the Thai diaspora in Germany. Mm. So in former times, there was a outside and inside. So the Goethe Institute was not at all responsible for any cultural programs in Germany only outside of Germany, so bring German artists to Thailand, bring sometimes Thai artists to Germany, and the, the I think uh, 10 Goethe Institutes in Germany, that they are, there were only uh, uh, language schools. So, and this is changing uh, in the moment, so very new. Mm. Um, for example, uh, we supported this year, the first time, two programs in Berlin, in Germany, uh, the first program was an exhibition about the Thai Park, which is a place in Berlin where all the Thai diaspora people meet and talk, and very important socially. Um, and this exhibition uh, started in Berlin and was just uh, two weeks ago, we brought the exhibition to Bangkok. So we care also about these people who are living in Germany, and the other group is, are the Thai artists living in Germany. They were very invisible. It's so difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, Abinan could perhaps explain. There are so many artists from all over the world living in Berlin. So how could they impress themselves? How can they be seen as a group? And this collective called um, Untitled, uh, they got a lot of support this year from us. And they also made a wonderful Thai short film festival in Berlin. So this is, this is just new for us. 
it's a start, but that will be for the next years, I think, also much more important. That the exchange, the cultural exchange between the two countries is not only happening here, mm. it's also happening in Germany. Mm. Because we have to learn from them also, like a multi multicultural society. Uh, so it's an impact, it's not a help. It's also for Germans mm. very, very uh, sensible uh, mm. to, to see this. Um, and perhaps just to mention that the 25,000 Thai people are living in Germany and 25,000 Germans living in Thailand. So there are this deep relation and, and yeah, that is something where the Goethe Institute is going into this field too. Um, perhaps uh, one more important point is that the Goethe Institute in our days we are see as, as a platform for dialogue I mean, I think Andrew already mentioned it, and Roland too, but it's becoming more and more important. We want to, be, we want to give protected rooms for uh, people to discuss uh, democratic uh, developments, to discuss their uh, possibilities of future, to build uh, the country in the future. And the Goethe Institute is just giving space. We are, we are not on one side or on the other side, mm. but we try to create these rooms, like you said, from our libraries, from your libraries um, in, in Serbia after the, the Yugos Yugoslavia war, that the people have a chance to meet, and mm. but to be protected in a way. Mm. So that becomes more and more important um, from our side. And then the other big, big issue is uh, the actual pandemic crisis, the COVID crisis. So, I mean, everyone is talking about digitalization. Also, the Goethe Institute is dreaming to become a digital institute. But I think all of us, all of you, have this Zoom fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, so what we learned in the last nine months is that the digital formats can never be standing alone. So the physical, the physical talks, the physical um, exchange is still so important. And I think this conference is a good example that both together <laughs> is also a kind of future format um, which, which should be developed. And another point is that we just try to connect uh, the cultural scene from abroad and from uh, Thailand in this difficult time where no one can travel. We just finished tonight the um, cultural festival, a house in many parts. This is this uh, is a project together with the Alliance Francaise and the French Embassy. And the original idea was just to have a pavillon to invite artists from France and Germany to Thailand and that they could spend four weeks together to discuss and then nothing was possible. Apinan with the BIB had the same experience. Uh, two weeks quarantine is a really hard thing, so most of the artists mm. would, not, would not do it. But then we had the idea that, we, that the French and the German artists, they, they send the care packages to Thai artists. And that was our experiment of the last two weeks. We had several events where the Thai artists packed out the art from Germany and Paris, and then they made something with it. And I was, I'm more than happy that this experiment was just function because they were in a dialogue. They had, they had I mean, they spoke, they, they exchanged ideas. And this is, uh, from my perspective also, very, very important for the future. Okay, and I think I'm already too long. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so I, I have the, some questions to you too, but uh, before going to the questions, I would like to switch to uh, two cultural professionals. So thank you for Andrew and uh, Maren. And uh, Dr. Apinan and uh, Ms. Sasapin are now both are the artist directors of uh, in the field of contemporary art and in the field of contemporary theater. But first, my first question to you is uh, more like uh, your uh, as an independent artist or a curator or a professor or a actress or a producer, uh, I think both of you have a lot of experiences to work with many cultural organizations in the many countries. And also, maybe you have a, a lot of experience to work with the embassies too. And maybe inviting to their home country, or you might have a collaborating project with their 
countries. Mm -hmm. So from your past experiences, I want to know that if you have any impressive um, thing that, oh, their conditions seem to be very favorable for the artist, or, oh, why they have to ask us some limitation or something like, I don't know, there might be something, you might have some positive feeling and uh, somehow negative feeling even each organization or embassy might have a goodwill to, to, to invite you. Mm. So I want to know your answers, comments first. And Dr. Apinan first, please. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bishop Hassan, and thank you, the Japan Foundation, for organizing this uh, symposium. Uh, it's a great honor to, to be here. Uh, I've been asked to, to give an overview of, of my uh, experience as uh, independent curator as well as the, uh, the time that I worked at the Ministry of Culture and presently working for, for the Bangkok Art Biennale Foundation. So in that way, there, there are many, uh, over the time of 30 years, it's been like a, a, a variable uh, experiences and also the time. But first of all, I'd like to, to discuss in terms of uh, cultural diplomacy because uh, Cultural diplomacy has to be seen in context of cultural hegemony mm. and cultural imperialism, which has been the result of uh, many uh, disagreements, uh, many contestations, hence the result of these goodwill institutions. And we have discussed uh, already that there have been some talk about the limitation of cultural diplomacy uh, because hegemony is the power of control, but also cultural diplomacy can also mean seduction mm -hmm. in the sense that it can lure and become very attractive. But the ways of attraction and the reciprocal uh, results depend very much on the bilateral uh, communications or in some cases multilateral exchanges. So over the time, uh, in the context of Siam or Thailand, uh, the exchanges and, and the seduction, and this could be vice versa, uh, have been enriching and, and sometimes has been uh, vehicles for, for making various cultures understand each other more or at times uh, can reduce friction and trauma when such things happen such as coup d'etat. So in this way, um, I will give you some, can I sh go with the slides, please? Uh, go back. Okay, it's okay. Um, I start with this. Uh -huh. um, this was uh, just after the coup d'etat in 2015. And Thailand or the Thai government were almost rejected by so many European and other countries mm -hmm. because of the Junta government. Nobody wanted to accept or talk with them. So we had this project at the Royal Albert Hall. The Royal Albert Hall in London was the place where uh, during that reign of King Jalalongkorn, there were some musicians who went to perform there. So after those years, this is the first time that this troupe went to perform. So the kind of cultural links became very important. So in this way, uh, to show such uh, grandiose performance in this hall uh, can make the cultural connection. And we also made exchanges and projects related to films. Coinciding with this project, we also showed the film festival at BAFTA, as well as the contemporary art uh, by Thai artists at Sachi Gallery. So in this way, during the time of very much the, the uh, hangover or the intensity of the coup d'etat, we had to push something through the not just the Thai government, but through the uh, embassies and the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So just to show you that this is one example where culture can, can do certain things where 
the power, the hard power cannot. This is uh, an example of the, the works by Pindari Sanvitak, a female woman artist, a female, uh, female artist who, who showed her works um, in 2006. This is going back, 2000, 2006 in Paris, during the project called Tuta Fetai. This is when the Thaksin government uh, made a lot of contacts through culture, uh, soft power, if you will, with France, and we created uh, this project, Tuta Fetai, in Paris, and La Fête by the French here in Bangkok. Uh, only a few days after the show opened, there was a coup. So we're just saying that the examples of what we have to go through and the cultural institutions, whether it be Goethe, British Council, Alliance, all these have to look at their respective countries and embassies, how they behave with the government in, in this context, Thailand. Just to make that point, but in terms of Japan, um, in 1994, uh, I had a discussion with the Japan Foundation uh, regarding uh, hegemon hegemony. And we discussed how Japan looked at Southeast Asia, how the Japan looked in terms of the big brother who looked across Southeast Asia as the place where they can manipulate. And we, we set examples of, for example, the Fukuoka Genale, where they sent teams of curators to, to select Southeast Asian artists. And in many cases, Japan Foundation select Japanese curators to select Thai artists to show in Japan. So very much one way, one way look, scrutiny at those respective countries. So we had the discussion, of why can't we look back to Japan? And when I raised this issue, there was a lot of intense <laughs> discussion, you know, a lot of, a lot of wind sucking by the Japanese because this would not happen, you know, like uh, we, we, we can't do this. So I said, why not? So in 1999, I chose the most controversial Japanese artist to come to Thailand, to Bangkok, Nobuyushi Araki. Many of you know mm. of his works. Yeah. Uh, if not, uh, he's into photographs of uh, Sado masochism. Yeah. And we asked him to come to Thailand. And of course, this raised a lot of, a lot of pain with the Japan Foundation. <laughs> 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 and especially, especially the ambassador, uh, Mr. Ota. Mm -hmm. Because um, in order to have uh, Araki here, I work with uh, Mr. Toshio Hara, uh, the director of the Hara Museum, who is a good friend of Araki. And Araki came to Thailand with his team and to take photos of a lot of very mischievous photos. And at the opening, we, we asked uh, the embassy whether the ambassador could come. So you can imagine, Yoshiko-san, the, <laughs> the ambassador of Japan, um, at the time there was a lot of traffic jam, but so he had to get on the motorcycle <laughs> to arrive in time for Araki. <laughs> and we opened this. And, and just to show you know, that uh, Cultural diplomacy can also be a lot of fun, mm -hmm. but a lot also of asking back, asking back of what about me, what about us? To follow that, um, in another project on, on another slide called Taiyo. See, after the, after the exchange through Araki, uh, I had a lot of uh, exchanges with uh, Japanese curators, whether it be uh, Eshiko Sumariko Trinale with uh, from Kitekawa or Yokohama Trinale. But this one we showed uh, after we had the Show Me Thai exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, where uh, uh, we showed 50 artists uh, during the Thai Japanese uh, anniversary year. And in return, we, we showed this project Taiyo uh, at BSCC. Mm -hmm. And we talked about Again, digital art, uh, kawaii, uh, mu uh, music, uh, exchanges, and we had uh, modern dog. We had um, modern dog uh, singing with uh, Sutep. And these are the exchanges that we thought that it would be um, a kind of something that we work with Japan Foundation. And it's like our initiation, not just a one-way uh, contact.
uh, this is the show at the mod where we had works of Rikit Tiravanit, uh, Navin Ravan Chaikun, who's married to the Japanese curator, Munten Bunma, and we had Tawanda Chani to perform paintings uh, in Tokyo. And this is out of focus, but it's uh, the only picture we have of Tawanda Chani and Araki together. Ah. So this is a historical, the two notorious artists, yes. <laughs> Bangkok <laughs> and Tokyo. Yeah. But anyway, let's jump to uh, Bangkok Art Biennale, just to show you that uh, the, our foundation, Bangkok Art Biennale Foundation, is, is very young. It's only four years, four years old, not 60, only four <laughs> years old. Okay. And we, we set up so that uh, we can show artworks, uh, not, not as a counter, but uh, to give the alternative to, to the government-initiated projects. So Biennale means every two years. And this was the 2018, the first edition of Bangkok Art Biennale, where we had Pichet Kanchun uh, perform uh, at Chang Chui. And, you know, the ideas of showing or not showing, you know, how to, how to present, and sometimes you have to consider what can be shown or not. But in this case, Pichet showed um, his performances related to the coup d'etat as well, and the criticism on the military. So in this way, performance can show a lot of, of resistance and anger, I think, which is, again, applicable right today during, during this, this hard time in Bangkok. Sorry, let's go forward quickly. And, for example, this is Duk Dao. She also l made long duration of performances, uh, seven, eight hours a day at the, on the eighth floor of Bangkok uh, Art and Cultural Center. Now... This edition, we showed uh, works by many artists, 82 artists altogether at the Bangkok Art Biennale with the theme of escape routes. When we discussed this morning, or sorry, this afternoon, uh, related to what can, can be shown or not can be shown, and how, how do artists comply and not comply, or do not work as cultural instruments, in this context, we show Chinese artists, and, and as you know from this photo, uh, this is an installation work by Ai Weiwei, the Chinese artist. And this is where the example of cultural di diplomacy came into friction, whereby you know, we, we were asked politely by the embassy of China to remove this work before it was shown. So uh, we have to be very diplomatic in terms that we say that this is the work of Ai Weiwei, who, who is the, the figure of symbol of, of refugees, migration. And we're just showing this work, and, and it's, not, it's not a criticism to the Chinese government. And we had to go ahead because uh, this is uh, what we've chosen, and, and it showed for one month uh, on the ninth floor of Bangkok Art Biennale. Now, now it's ended. But it's just to show the example of, of the limitation of cultural diplomacy. And in, in this way, uh, the artists have, and we have to stand with the artists. And this is the detail of his wallpapers. Many of you have seen his works. He talks about uh, diaspora, he talks about migration, but in context of how he places uh, the technique of hieroglyphs and the way he used uh, black and white graphics. So in this way, um, you know, we, we went ahead and we, we stood our grounds and we res respect uh, what we have to show. Um, I will quickly go, uh, there's no time, any time left? <laughs> Not so much. Sorry, shall I stop? So can, More, yeah, yeah. Huh? Maybe can, 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 go, can go next part? But how many, how many more slides? Uh, three more slides. Qu quickly. Okay, quickly. Um, okay, this is, uh, this is work by Sir Anish Kapoor. Uh, Mumbai artist, but uh, now living in London. So we worked this special project with Anish, uh, and he, he would have loved to come to Bangkok, mm. but the project he proposed is absolutely fantastic. It's still showing at Wat Poh, at the Sermon Hall at Wat Poh, and it, it has received enormous uh, uh, positive feedback because this is uh, three tons of wax that we brought over from London. And this is a structure where you know, we place this in the in the sermon hall at Wat Po, the, the oldest building in the temple of Wat Po complex. 
and the process is has been horrendous because in terms of the installation, the assistants coming over, having go through the quarantine, um, and, and the work is, is absolutely stunning, so please don't miss it. Also this work by also Anish Kapoor at Wat Arun. Uh -huh. This one is called Sky Mirror. Mm. It's a public uh, work where actually Anish wanted to, to make the sky come down to the earth and the interaction as you go and look at the uh, stainless steel piece is absolutely amazing because it changes continuously from, from morning to night. And I just end here for the moment that, uh, of course, Yoko Ono. Thank you very much, Kevin Foundation, for, <laughs> for the support. Uh, in Bangkok Art Biennale, we have uh, two Japanese artists, Yoko Ono and Yukon Teruya. And I should just show you the date of this photo, 16th of October, 2020. So this is the day when there was a lot of confrontation outside the SEC. Eh? A lot of you know, water cannons, water, a lot of resistance. Uh, just to show you that we, we went ahead with Bangkok Art Biennale, despite COVID, despite uh, disruption, despite all these problems. So it is, we, we want to show that the artist can really say something, can make the message felt, because the, the artist wanted to, to show that they are the symbol of nonviolence, symbol of resistance, and, and they are the ones who can find our paths toward peace. So I will just end here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, Princess Daphne? Ah, thank you. After the same question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you also. I, I think I'll just have one okay, video. Okay. So yeah. Thank you. Okay. yeah, thanks for being here. And it's, uh, it's a real honor to be sharing panels with everyone here. Because I, and I say that in, in, in honesty, because BIPAM, which I represent right now, is uh, a young platform initiated by Nobody, <laughs> really nobody, meaning just artists and independent um, performing arts producers and which s saying that it sounds like a big name, but it's really just people working, doing whatever they have to do. And one day these people s decided to just gather and do something new that they think is needed for the performing arts scene that they love. Um, and BIPAM started in 2017. What we are, the full name of BIPAM is Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting. And um, it is a networking platform where we create a space um, for exchange, dialogue, conversation for Thai and Southeast Asian artists, also with interactions to the international communities. I have a short video that I would like to show just so you can see the, what BIPAM is like, really. So maybe you can start the video. Thank you. อยากให้มาเจอกันเจอกันแล้วสิ่งที่จะได้ก็คือความคิดของเราที่มันอยู่นิ่งๆมันจะเกิดการเคลื่อนไหวเกิดการแลกเปลี่ยนมาเจอกันค่ะมาคุยกันเยอะๆแล้วคิดกันเยอะๆ
friends and partner, as well as the Japan Foundation, also the Goethe Institute, who have been working with us, um, not just Five Time, but also the performing arts community in Thailand for so long. And we're really grateful for the friendships. We haven't had so much opportunity. I think we've had some opportunity in the past with the British Council, but not so much uh, at the moment. But I have heard from some friends who are in the fashion industry that you are working uh, tremendously with them also. Um, so yes, in the performing arts scene in Bangkok, um, I think today I'm speaking <coughs> as artistic director of Vipam, but also as an independent artist, independent producer of performing arts, and also a member of theater collective myself. So I'm wearing quite a few hats. And with all these roles that I've been playing in the past 10 something years, um, yes, we have had a lot of relationships with international um, cultural institutes in Thailand. And there are different kinds of relationships and um, Frankly speaking, we do rely a lot on these help and support because we lack this direct support from within our own country. So this help has been uh, of tremendous assistance to our existence and our um, to continuing our mission in making art to, to the society. So we've worked uh, as, as a member of the theater collective and also of BIPEM, we've worked with many countries within Southeast Asia, also in East Asia, some in Europe, sometimes in North America as well. And I would say that the general differences between each <coughs> um, organization or institute, I would say um, it's divided into an organization that stays an organization or an organization that acts like a friend. And of course there will be somebody who stays in between these two. And very often we we really love the relationship that we could make as a friend with an organization because that makes everything easier easier not not in terms of financial support but easier in terms of really human level understanding between people to people because sometimes you talk organizations you think of buildings you think of names and all the little departments you have to go which uh, office doors you have to knock mm -hmm. but when an organization acts as a friend then you think of the people you know exactly uh, it's Maren that I have to talk to for example it's Kunyo that I have to talk to it's not the Japan Foundation which is the building so this is the relationship that I think consequently brings the right kind of curation, if I may use that term, uh, by saying the right curation, I mean um, knowing what you want and who you want and who, I think you cannot really know who a person really is until, unless you spend time getting to know that person, whether indirectly or directly. And so I think the key to um, fostering deep relationship really comes with the luxury of time and space that an, an institute or an embassy can afford to give uh, to artists or, or a community. However, it's not that uh, an organization that remains an organization is really like, you know, a black hole in the spot and we don't want to talk to them. It's, it's not like that at all, but it's just a different um, relationship. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I think the perks of organization is that they, they have resources and the structures are very clear. The processes in which an artist or community works with them would be very clear. So in that sense, it's also simple and easy. So there are pros and cons to both, but I, I know that from an artist's perspective, a, a human level relationship is really what we appreciate uh, from all this time that, that we've worked with these institutions. Um, there's also a question that you asked earlier about invitations or initiations. How do we plan our international uh, coordination or international exchange? Is it just by invitation or is it also by initiation? I have seen both, I have also done both. And um, by invitations, I think the, the benefits of an invitation from an organization is that it's an eye-opening opportunity that maybe the, ar the artists might have not otherwise have thought of. So this is kind of you know, brought to the door. And usually this is kind of something quick to happen. It can happen very easily and it opens doors to something that is out of our usual perception. However, by initiation is definitely, very apparently it comes from the wish and the desires of the artists and the art community 
So it's a direct um, reaching out of hands. This is what we would like to do. This is people who we'd like to be connected with. And, and then the cultural institutes would come um, in the, in the role of contributing and facilitating that initiation to make it, to realize that and make it happen. So I guess these are kind of the two ways that we can look at how international collaborations and exchange can happen. Um, speaking of why international, why, why would one day Thai artists want to go international? Why do we even connect internationally at all? I think it's already been made very clear from the the early afternoon discussion, also from the three presenters here with us, but also from 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 my perspective, running BIPAM, I am an artist that one day kind of just decided to jump in with the BIPAM team and make a platform, and it looks like uh, pretty scary <laughs> that in in ten years' time or so we may become an organization ourselves without knowing it, and I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but at the moment, um, in connecting internationally is for, for something new and different. And you need that new and different in order to get to, to know that there are possibilities, especially in the times where there are so many dead ends in your own society, in your country, in your culture. And it's, it's just really to fuel mm -hmm. the, the life and the heart of the artist to, to be in touch with something different, with other possibilities and knowing that there are other ways to go. There are different kinds of life, of operation that can be made and can be done. And I think me and a lot of fellow artists who are sitting here in Thailand who are watching the, this symposium, we were like, wow, maybe if we were just bo born in a different country, maybe it wouldn't, be, <laughs> would, it wouldn't have been so hard, for example, you know. So I think BIPAM is it's not really, I wouldn't say paving ways because it's not just by Pam who is doing this, but we're one of the, the players that are trying to look for ways that we can start with our own hands to, to bring in um, possibilities, doorways, gateways to, to new openings and new, yeah, possibilities and, and opportunities, I think. Um, I... I think I had some ideas from this morning about why contemporary and and traditional, right? That there's there's I think from Dr. Singui she mentioned. Um, no, actually it's it's from Mr. Clay. It's from Germany that's mentioned uh, art. We don't Germany doesn't export art, but that art is, uh, that is German, but more like art, and art is from Germany and not German art. And I think this uh, differentiation is very important because this is the, di the kind of differentiation that I don't think we discuss a lot in Thailand. When we say Thai art, it's generally understood that it's, there's, a, there's this, you know, questionable Thai identity that we assume that there, it is true out there. <laughs> But can we talk about art that is from Thailand as well? Art that is by Thai people or by people who live in Thailand even, who might not even be Thai. So, and this comes to the question between the nationalism and internationalism. Because nationalism, I think, connects very much to this idea that there is something specifically Thai that is there. And we have to look for this and we only will nurture and take care of this Thai, Thai, Thai culture and art. And you know, the discussion whether it, this is even existing is another matter, I think. But for internationalism, I think we, we would go for art that is by Thai people, or art that is made in Thailand, or is relevant to the Thai contemporary society. And so for me, it, roughly speaking, Thai art, that means, you know, this individual, um, this identity of Thailand, some Thainess, something that we, we assume that exists very uniquely, is connected to nationalism and traditionalism. However, the contemporary is connected to internationalism in this sense that we are not talking about an assumed nationalistic identity, but we're talking about what is actually happening by 
real people in real time, but just looking geographically where it's happening. And of course, it will be influenced by the social, um, you know, geopolitical, social, and cultural context anyway, without having to uh, create borders or draw lines that only this is Thai, only this is German, only this is Jap Jap Japanese or British, but who is it made by and why is it made? And if it is brought to another country, why is there that need or that wish to bring that into a different context? What kind of dialogue does it create? So, um, and that kind of dialogue is what BIPAM is trying to bring to the contemporary performing arts community in Thailand. Um, not that we think that the artists need help, I don't think that's kind of the charity mindset that we have, but it's more like we would like to um, give them more waves, I think. If, if, if there is already a lot of waves that they can pick on to pick you know, inspirations to, to work with, I guess that because BIPAM um, is with a team with international and international mindset and also international connections, we see that there are more waves and more inspirations that we can bring to our artists here who, for whatever reason, might not have the opportunities to travel, to have direct exposure to, to international um, inspirations. So BIPAM is just one of the many initiatives by, by artists and art practitioners in Thailand that would like to bring the dialogue to home rather than for them, for, for the artists to have to find means to travel so so that this is more in in two-way exchange yeah i think mm -hmm. i'll end okay. my answer here for the <laughs> thank moment. you very much thank you okay uh, actually i have some questions to all of you but um I, I, because there are time limitations i would like to uh finish this second section actually can it this can connect to the wrap-up session so may i invite uh yeah. online speaker and also Thank you, T. Are you okay? I'm okay for time. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. oh, no, no, no. I mean the uh, online okay speakers and uh, thank you, T. All, all can be together for the wrap-up session, but I will have some questions to the speakers. But after that, I can leave the question to all all speakers. Okay, sorry, it's really mo can it may take some time. If so, I will I, I, I will have a quick question to to Andrew first. Mm -hmm. why, why not Shakespeare already? <laughs> <laughs> why it it seemed to be no one bring it here in Thailand in these days, right? We actually did have a program, I think in two thousand and four no, two thousand fifteen, I think it was called Shakespeare Lives, we which we did internationally. Um one answer to that question is does the British Council need to promote, share Shakespeare? Mm. Is he not an internationally known figure in every country? What, what value can we necessarily add there? Mm. I think it often comes back, you know, it does often come back to priorities and resources. You know, listening to Sassafin as well, there are so many things that we could do. Mm if we had unlimited resources of, mm. you know, of, of funding and, and, mm. and time mm. uh, to get involved in. Mm. So uh, we do have to prioritize. And when you choose, when you select some things, you automatically mm. deselect others, if you like. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that's not to say mm. that... So, so you mean yeah. the, when you say that you build a trust by cultural mm. relations, mm. So the, the the meaning of cultural relation for for British Council seems to be shifted to more building uh, personal networks and uh, how to say engagement with people rather than uh, more than how to say display of British cultural yeah very 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 much so yes um, I see very and then I, I actually I would like to ask all of you a question about the same things about I think the most of the cultural organization organizing uh, film festivals. And uh, one of the purposes is to let the other countries people to understand about the country by seeing the movie. 
I mean, promoting the understanding of that culture. Uh, so, but at the same time, this kind of film festival can be a, a showcase or display of culture to promote uh, image or to promote the branding of the uh, nation. And and I don't know how 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 I what my question is. How do you think about this kind of um, effect or how to say effect as a diplomatic tool to for your own country? I don't know. You you understand my question? Yes. yes. Perhaps I can just answer. Yeah, yeah. I also want to uh, want to uh, tell. I mean, we had the same problem uh, like you with Shakespeare, <laughs> with for example, Bertolt Brecht. Yeah. So. We just have no audience in our days to show in German language theater pieces which are not really performed, which are really uh, in the original language. I mean, we, w we, would, we would find some German expert as an audience, but, mm -hmm. but we would not find a huge, young, uh, diverse yeah. audience. And in our days, this is very important. We are not here for, I mean, nothing against retired German <laughs> people in Thailand, but... but uh, for this, no, we, we that's, that's one important point why I think this policy changed mm. in the last mm. 20 years. That, that the taste is different in our days and the wish of the audience is different. The other point for the film festival, for Germany I can just say we are starting in January our German film season in Thailand and it's definitely the choice or we, we choose movies which are not may promote Germany, which are showing an actual, actual window to German culture and to problems in Germany too. Mm. Not to show a oh, wonderful country, everything is fine. Also to show what kind of problems, generation comp problems, multicultural problems, political problems li like with uh, far right people, far left people. So. This is really, this should be a window. And I mean, movies are still so wonderful as a cultural possibility because you have not to invite every, every time some filmmaker. You can, but that's not the point. So you, you can show it and, and it's be there. So um, I mean, also I think Japan Foundation, you are doing your, a lot of film screenings. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The, the, the scheduled for the online presenters, it would be in about 15 minutes time. So, uh, you, we still have time. Yes, uh, but we would we have questions from from the live audiences uh, in YouTube streaming that we would like to ask every one of you here right now, five of you first, and then we can share with our online speakers up there. Okay, so first off, um, this is a question from uh, Shun Ying Wei. And uh, the question is, due to COVID-19 travel restrictions, very timely question, international travel are more expensive than before. Could you please share your experience on creative ways to conduct cultural exchange activities? Uh, perhaps I, I already uh, mentioned a little yeah. bit. It's, it's just to find new ways also to stream a lot. For example, there's a huge and very close a connection between the club scene in Bangkok, Thailand, and the club scene, the techno club scene in Berlin, and the Berlin Club Commission. They started a wonderful project, United We Stream, to support all the independent music clubs worldwide. And um, yeah, Thailand was a very strong part of it. So it happens also here that all the people in Berlin could could just watch the stream of a techno concert in a Bangkok club. And I think this is a new ways which we have to find the new, we have, I mean, we are really living in a time of experiment. No one knows if this would function, mm -hmm. but just to start and I think, yeah, that's, that's our answer of the COVID times, not to stop, but to change the formats. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, okay, if I can add to that, and I totally agree, Myron, but also to say that COVID has forced us to work in different ways and they're probably different ways we should have engaged and embraced five years ago, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. I mean, the technology isn't really, that we use isn't really fundamentally different to two or three years ago, um, but we have done so many different things. We've widened our audience, we've broadened our audiences. We've been able to reach more people. Um, we had an event, we had a, a situation, I think, in uh, 
was in March when um, we were doing our major public science competition, uh, which has an online audience of something like 10 million, 12 million people, I think, in, in Thailand. The semifinals were about to take place, I think, the f two days later. We, did, we went online. Uh, we did other parts of it online. We were able to do it uh, physically in July. Um, but I think this sort of hybrid model is one, is one to stay, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, practitioners for BIPAM and BAB? Yeah. Well, we, um, for Bangkok Art Biennale this edition, uh, we have uh, 82 artists participating, uh, 51 from internationally, uh, from all over the world, and 31 from Thailand. Um, we, we had to solve the problems, uh, not just logistics, uh, commissions, preparation, uh, but in terms of uh, making artworks, because uh, the initial plan was that the artists would, would create works at their countries and send over you know, the usual way. But because of COVID, we had to, to find ways, uh, hence the theme escape routes. Eh? We have to find ways in order to, to show the artworks. Uh, and we found many solutions. Um, for example, the well-known example I, I have given uh, in other talks is the artist uh, Rina Kalat, who's, who's based in Mumbai, and she was going to make the works in Mumbai and send them over to, to be installed, and she would come over. Uh, but because her assistants had to go back to the provinces, uh, we solved it in such a way that we created her works, a big installation here in Bangkok through Zoom and, and live. Uh, each day she would, she would look at the art and we have assistants and artisans who created the works and it, and it came out brilliantly and mm -hmm. now it's being shown at the, uh, at the park, at one, of the, our, one of our venues. But to bring artists over, uh, it's not impossible. You know, we brought over performance artists like uh, Melati, uh, Ho Rui An. Uh, next month we will bring uh, over artists from uh, Munich from uh, also from Canada, from Spain. So we have to go through the process whereby we have to work with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the embassies at various countries, and through the quarantine. It's, it's very complicated and it's very expensive, but, but we, we have to do it. I, in this way, especially performance artists, you know, they, we, we feel that uh, after a while you can go online but you, you sleep doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, you fall asleep because it gets yeah. boring after a while. So you, you, art, you need to actually see and, and touch and, and, and be, be in touch. So in this way, um, we're learning and I think we, we will find uh, many solutions in order to make uh, such international events work. Yeah. Yeah, for BIPEM, um, 2020, when after, the, after COVID hit and we had the lockdown, um, our board of artistic um, committee, we, we spent a lot of time having meetings trying to plan for the next edition. And um, then after quite a few meetings, we had to come back to the very simple question, what do we want to do and talk about in this situation? And you have to imagine, and that's like in April or May, everybody's still at home, you, cannot, you don't really want to go outside. And to connect to Southeast Asia, what does it mean? And for us, we, it just really meant we just wanted to find out how everybody is doing in, in the region. And so it became this ambition of wanting to connect to all the Southeast Asian countries, including the ones that we never connected before because we never thought about asking them to fly over to Bangkok as, as we would have done in the previous editions. And I, I would have to say that it's an ambition that I wasn't sure that we would actually realize, but in the end we managed to curate this um, series called Under the Sea, S-E-A-C, Southeast Asia, um, and having Zoom conversation with artists from 11 different ASEAN countries throughout 11 Saturdays. It's a, it's a long series, but it's a, it's a great success for us. It, it doesn't mean that it has like, you know, thousands of people watching, but for us, it's really su successful in the sense that we really brought together Southeast Asia in this sense, and we did spend time, the time that I was talking about before, each Saturday, talking to one specific country, getting to know these uh, artists better and know, you know, 
more and and also kind of seeing their home, seeing the cats as they walk by, seeing the the artist's son as he was crying in the background, really looking at what our neighbors are 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 living like, you know, like that. And that that's one series that happened from I think yeah, eleven Saturdays until October. And then Vipam just finished another exhibition where we exchanged with Festival Tokyo. We talked about collaboration for so long and then COVID hit and then, okay, what do we do with this exchange now? It became this challenge for the artists of both cities that we asked them to try to research each other's city by transporting the five senses that usually you would perceive with your body, but how do you digitalize this perception and deliver that across the online platform to the other city and then collaborate um, to make a, a result in a final exhibition which showed first in Festival Tokyo in Tokyo and then at a jam factory in Bangkok which is ended. So it already we are seeing a lot of different ways to collaborate online but I agree with the, our presenters here too that online is not here to replace offline or physical events but mm -hmm. they should be here to enhance the the real experience of art that we still need as a human being. May I also quickly? Yes, please, please. Th th there's there's another question directly for Japan Foundation. Okay. Well. <laughs> uh, firstly, though, the two points. Uh, we also have, the, as Japan Foundation Bangkok, we have uh, uh, experiences to um, to organize online events for the last uh, six or nine months. Uh, first observation is um, we can reach more people than before by doing online. For example, actually the Japan Foundation Bangkok's um, purpose is to introduce Thai culture to, to Japan too. And even we organized, uh, and we organized the one film, film project about the Deep South uh, Thailand through the uh, films made by Deep South filmmakers. And we do it online. So uh, both uh, Japanese in Japan and in Thailand could attend the, the film screening. And as it is film screening, I think even with we have no physical contact, it seems to be work well. But the other point is, um, when we try to, uh, um, how to say, build a new network of people, it seems to be doing by online seems to be weak. Uh, we, we're still in the moment that how we evaluate this, this point. But uh, if we just maintain the existing networks by uh, people f who we know already online, it's easy. We can do confidence, we can do many good conversations. But if we do online by trying to new connect new people, it seems to be very weak. That might be uh, some of the reason that we, we still need uh, physical contact is important. And I, I, hear, I cannot remember the who is the resources, but uh, I hear from someone say that uh, if uh, you ask one orchestra to, to get the conductor online, it seems to be uh, having conductor online and having conductor on site is makes the music totally different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, the reason seems to be uh, the musicians see the conductor not only by hands or something, but total of the body, mm -hmm. uh, how to say. Not only the this and the maybe expression and the something that cannot be how to say explained in words. Mm. So that that's very interesting uh, findings I hear. Then mm. so we're still continuing to how what kind of events can be online and what cannot be online. Mm. Yes. It's very interesting, especially the project of the Deep South because I believe it is still not advised for, for Japanese citizens to go to some yeah, country, some also, provinces yeah. Yeah. in the Deep South. So I think this project is wonderful, but also, you know, in, in terms of what uh, I believe uh, Mr. Rats has said, that it's very difficult to gain trust via online Zoom meetings. So I think the word enhanced is very um, important here right now. So I believe we have all three online speakers with us, so we can have a conversation mm. all together from now. <laughs> uh, and uh, we would like to invite uh, our two other two uh, speakers here, uh, Dr. Kitty and Dr. Ratanan as well. Oh, Dr. Kitty, 
โอเคเอาล้นด้วยเอาลีดอกใจกิติมาเกี่ยวหอกเก้าอี้ได้ค่ะเ
some activities or project? This is my question. Hmm? But I don't know anybody can. Do you want me to? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. As well, well, the world is not all politeness, you know. The the world is full of traumas, problems, and artists do not have to to comply with goodwill. Mm. You know, if if you have projects for goodwill, you go through government. For example, the Thai government have their 20-year plan of Thainess promotion, and Thainess means also exclusion mm. or Nihonganess mm. or Chineseness. I don't know, but mm. in this way, the artists have the freedom to express themselves. So we're talking about life. We're talking about, like I mentioned, Ai Weiwei is controversial artist, but he has other positive. He has many followers. And if we show him, and we have to be so considerate with afraid of so many doors being closed, then, then don't do it. You know, we just, you know, be static. So I think other artists, you know, like uh, what I mentioned, the, the Kurd artist, uh, Rashdi Anwar, who's one of the artists, mm -hmm. refugee artist uh, living in Chiang Mai. Mm -hmm. He shows about diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Francois Roche, you know, who's, who's been living here, he, he, he creates works. Uh, he talks about all kinds of, uh, you know, problems, psychological. So in this way, I think art has maybe so many riches and layers beyond cultural diplomacy. So what comes first, you see? What comes first? So in this way, Bangkok Art Bintale Foundation gives the op opportunity for, for the, the people to express themselves. Mm. Of course, we get into trouble sometimes because we don't know we cannot please everyone. Mm. But I think uh, if we're so afraid of doing anything, uh, we sometimes we limit ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think it's sometimes a question of how you look at things. Because very often, people who are closed and don't like the other, if you like, they speak louder. Mm -hmm. Populist politicians speak louder than conciliatory politicians, I think. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we hear them more, and we do hear them more, and they exist. But if you think about young people across the world coming together interested and passionate about climate change, mm -hmm. if you think about how the, um, the vaccines for COVID-19 have been developed, international collaboration between scientists, I mean, look at the one from... The, the people of Turkish origin in, in Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. um, look at artists collaborating anyway. Look at students across parts of Southeast Asia raising their voices for democratic freedoms. There's a lot of good things out there happening, and there's a lot of international, link, international links happening as well. I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. That's not to say the, the negative things don't exist. Of course they do. But it's, maybe it's a more nuanced picture. I see. I see. I think yeah, Mr. Lonau? Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> only, one, only one remark. Uh, we have shown Ai Weiwei in the German pavilion at the Venice Biennial a few years ago. And it was a decision of the curator of the pavilion to show Ai Weiwei with some of his works. And um, we sh have shown it as art uh, in, in our pavilion. But I, I want to say, to, to, to say a few words about the nationalism and how great the world is changing. I don't know if you know the, the VUCA theory. And I think it's, it's very interesting. They, they, it's, um, 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 they try to, to explain the world in four words. And um, the, the first one is the world is volatile. This is the expression, volatile, so everything is fluid. The second thing, I, everything is unsure. Everything, the C is everything is highly complex and very difficult to understand how it works. And everything is full of contradictions. Yeah, that's a VUCA word. word. Um, and I think it's a good explanation and a good um, uh, model to, to understand how the people maybe feel in an, such an unsure, highly complex, and completely full of contradict world full of uh, contradiction. And that provokes as well the, the nationalism, for example. And I think as we, we see that a lot of states. As, as well in, in Europe, are becoming l always less and less democratic. 
And um, for, for me, it's, it's a reason why the cultural dialogue and cultural understanding is so important, even more important because the contradiction is there is another tendency. Yeah, there's another way that the states are, are going. And so we, our work is always more and more important to, to save the, the, the democracy, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Have any comments on this question? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So. Uh, I think, uh, it, especially in a closed community, in, in a community that wants to stay closed and ex excluding other people, that's where we we may have to reach out uh, as cultural and artistic um, practitioners because the role of art and culture should be that we, I, I know that I deal with this word a lot, possibility, but I still believe that this is what the art gives to people. Mm, where it's the most close, that's where you want to give, bring art into, into that area in order to open doors of, of thinking, of emotion, of feelings, of also human relationships. Of course, this sounds really romanticized, but there are different ways that you can do that. Of course, a smart mediator would not just go into a, a, a community with one mindset and just bring people from you know, extremely different mindsets and just let them clash. But in the arts world or in the cultural world, apart from the artists and institutions, there are also mediators. So I think we can also focus on the roles of these people where, um, the policy maker or the institutes come up with a project, a plan, a policy, and we have artists that we know can initiate some ideas or can really spark some inspiration, but also the important roles of the mediators who can connect and bridge these two groups, not so that they can become friends, it might not be possible in a short period of time, but at least for them to get a sense of the difference that's on the other end, on the other extreme, that there is such an idea existing on, a, on the other side and the people can decide what they would like to make out of that discovery of difference, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. This question, is any, anyone else? No, okay. Uh, then I would like to ask uh, another question to, uh, mainly to uh, Miss um, Marlin and uh, Ro Ronald, it, because about uh, German, uh, as you said, uh, in German, so you 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 in a, you know, your foreign culture policy that you can support uh, culture, not German culture, but the ge culture from German or culture in German too, and that's why Getty Institute can support Thai diaspora in Germany nowadays, and. Uh, relationship with this, this kind of uh, policy and also about the national interest that uh, Dr. Sindhu uh, proposed us that, uh, okay, the national I interest should be, how to say, uh, defined or the meaning should be uh, explored by bottom up too. And my, my question is, so in Germany, uh, you have already a very good <coughs> consensus in German society that, uh, how to say, the, in the Pauline policy, culture, not, not German culture, but culture in and from Germany should be promoted and supported even f by the governmental funds. Is it correct? Yes. And, and if so, uh, how this kind of consensus could be achieved? Mm. Perhaps Holland? Why not you want to answer first? <laughs> um, well, that's, that's one of the basic points, how we think and how we act. So the consensus is as well with every kind of, of um, um, it's a consensus of the society, independent of the government, for example, where we have several parties um, or foreign ministers uh, from, from several parties and all agreed on these principles. And because it, it, I think uh, it's successful, yeah, it's successful because it's um, 
it creates the trust we need. And it creates, or oh, it, it shows the, the, the openness of, of the society and how we are willing to, to integrate people if they want to be integrated. And how we are proud of those who are living here from, from other nationalities or other countries and who took Germany as their point of, of, of reference for their work. And they, they let the German society influence their, their art. So in respect of, of those high qualified artists, um, that's, that's um, well, we didn't have any problems with the, the consensus in the society with it. And if you speak about um, national interests, you know I'm, I'm um, not in favor of the word interests, uh, I prefer responsibility. I'm always asking what is, what is the interest in um, uh, cultural dialogue? If it's peace, if it's understanding, okay, I'm in favor of interest, I'm interested in peace and, and so on. But if, if it's an interest in other things like economy, so well, I think it's, it's not, at least not the, the, the cultural dialogue we think should be realized. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. Perhaps I can mention uh, one other aspect which is very important. So Germany has a problem like Japan and Thailand that the population is going down. Mm -hmm. So um, it's clear that Germany will be a country of migration and of a lot of people with other roots. That's absolutely clear, we cannot change it. Um, and I think it's good to start very early to include them and not to say this is a blonde German and the other ones are not Germans. I mean, we had this, this very awful Nazi time in, in Germany. Mm. And I think in our days, like, like you said, who one who decided to live in Germany, if you're, if you're a refugee or just uh, by interest in Germany, that makes no difference. This person is living in this country and will have a future in the country. And, and from this perspective, it's, it's very important to, to, make, to say, okay, German is not German. Uh, it's really some artist who is living there. I mean, we had Apinan and me, we had also um, the exchange for the pop artist. So we have a German artist living in London. She mm -hmm. is part of the... Uh, uh, Bab and uh, we have Thai artists. Uh, uh, she is living in Berlin. So, is this a German art artist? Is this Thai artist? Is this a UK artist? Mm. I think that should this question should not be so important in the future. The quality of art, or the mm. this is the most important answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this. Uh, direction of uh, German's foreign policy is, uh, as uh, someone said, uh, it's more like a post, post nation, post nation oriented, post state oriented, mm -hmm. maybe. But um, as far as I know, in historically, uh, the world tried to make um, a kind of um, beyond uh, national institute like uh, United Nations, uh, United <coughs> Leagues of Nations, and uh, United Nations. And I'm quite not sure if this kind of uh, international organizations are uh, uh, working well, or there are some issues that we have to uh, tackle with. But um, when when talk about the um, um, how to say uh, post post state or post nation, that um, but for the think about the national interest, especially for the political interest and the economical interest. Uh, there seem to be, at the framework, we can have an international standard or framework, but at the same time, always the national interest is very much nationalistic. But in case of national interest in the cultural spheres, that if we can be more like, a, a, how to say, beyond the border of a country, there might be some future direction for us that culture can be a good uh, good area to to form favorable international community or environment. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if it can be a question or not, but um, what um, so uh, what, what I want to make questions to all of you is uh, 
So especially in, in the context of Asian countries here, that we are more like tending to be a, more like a competition among the, each country, especially China, Korea, and Japan. But the Europe case is more like, uh, try to be more like uh, beyond uh, state level. But I don't know, in, in case of Asian, Asian countries, that that direction can be a good, good direction and we can uh, see Europe as a good example for the future or there might be some other way for the Asian context and maybe Ajahn Kitty can make some comments. Okay, uh, overall, I think after hearing uh, the second session, I think I am encouraged by the way the practitioners, the way the artists carry out their programs. Uh, I think the important thing is that the government should give freedom to the project, to the artists that they can express uh, their arts express their opinion, their ideas, that is a good thing. Uh, but for Asian country, I agree with uh, director about the competition. I think that is the key uh, problems that we are facing. We can still not move to the stage that the European country has been doing for a while now in terms of post-nationalist cultural promotion, post-nationalist engagement. Uh, but I do not hope that Asian country needs to wage several war first, and then we go to that direction. We should have a shortcut. We should have a shortcut by looking at the European examples. Uh, a decade ago, or 15 years ago, I started my research project on uh, regionalism in Asia, East Asian community and so on, we always look at Europe as the model. But at that time, I admitted that we look, I, I myself look at in terms of economic relation, strategic relation more. But uh, from this seminar, I am fully aware that cultural relations seem to be very powerful, very important forces that that can help amend and improve the relation among countries. So I do not have a clear answer yet. I think it's a question that we have to ponder for several years. But I think the direction is quite clear that we should develop our cultural engagement, cultural relation into not, I would say, cultural diplomacy 1.0. Now in Asia, more like a the cultural diplomacy 1.0, but in Europe, it moved beyond that to probably 3.0 already, not 2.0. The, the third stage of cultural diplomacy, cultural engagement. So I think that, that is my thought for now. Thank you very much. Uh, before going to the Q&A sessions, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Shin and uh, Professor Atsushi, uh, after having the second session and uh, uh, comments from the on site, do you have any comments? So maybe um, Dr. Shin first, yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to say that uh, um, those questions were very interesting. I couldn't really jump in. Um, I, first, I just want to say that um, I don't think Ai Weiwei is controversial. <laughs> I think the fact that we think he's controversial is very much our lack of engagement with Chinese art, contemporary art in particular. I think Ai Weiwei has been a icon of Chinese contemporary art mm -hmm. growing up in the, um, very, made his name sort of around 1980s and 1990s when Chinese contemporary art was very much a ground zero field you know, so the West looking into China via our way. But 20 years later, we still look at him and think that he's controversial. Mm -hmm. And that says something about us, I mm -hmm. think, rather than about him. And I think that exactly proves the point that there's huge space for us to do culture diplomacy work. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, we need to really kind of engage with the local scene which is what these agencies such as British Council did fantastic work in the late 90s in China, 
discovered huge groups of contemporary Chinese artists, bring them to international attention. Mm -hmm. And that's the role of uh, culture diplomacy agencies should perform, I think. They should mm -hmm. continue to, to be given the voices and the space to perform and build those people-to-people -people links. So I just want to say that. Um, I think I'm always good, but you know, can we have some diversity? Can we have some more younger female and more contemporary lesser known names in mm. um, these kind of international arts exhibitions. And the other, the other thing I just want to say is back to your last question uh, about this kind of, you know, the future for Asian um, or Asia Pacific culture diplomacy. And as I said in my talk, I think the, the key phrase for me is beyond the national interest should be in the national interest you know, I don't think there should be that dichotomy between the national interest and the, the kind of interest um, of the people. And that's something is already happening. In fact, I think the division is melting down. The, the two sides have, due to the digital platforms, I think, and popular culture rise and all the rest of it, I think that the middle division has gone or is melting, certainly. So it's not so much about how we engage. The engagement is already happening. It's just, uh, I think we need to really think about once these things are happening on the ground, how do we actually make sense of it? You know, how, how do we bring them to the fore, those voices, to, to really represent and reflect it in the national interest and in the national identity? And the big threat to that, I think, is that term creative industries. Mm -hmm. And I really think the creative industries should be not mentioned, ideally for me, in the Asia Pacific. I think they should all have their version of culture empowerment, culture policy, whatever they might want to call it. You know, Indonesia has already called different names mm -hmm. of their national creative economy, strategy, things like that. And China is also going out its own way. So I think it's about finding your own path and engage and really have your voice and letting that voice to represent yourself rather than formulating some kind of message from, from your perception of mm -hmm. your national identity. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Shibasaki-san. OK. So I would like to say thank you for all the participants uh, of this uh, session, too. And uh, um, I was totally moved. Uh, about, and I was so happy to uh, listen to your voice. And I really admire and respect what you, what you have been done and what you have been doing in Thailand. And, um, I really uh, would like to know about, uh, uh, no, no, as for the uh, national interest, I think one way to change the mind, hearts and minds of government officials, one uh, solution might be to invite all of them to uh, any cultural activities, <laughs> uh, maybe. But, and uh, uh, one uh, question uh, I would like to ask uh, to all of you is, um, about uh, national interest or culture, uh, the concept of cultural diplomacy in each country is, uh, have you ever seen any sign of change of the national interest or the concept of cultural diplomacy in uh, each country? Uh, I mean, through uh, your local activities in Thailand. For example, uh, have you ever seen any uh, instance of the influence of the, for example, uh, get Institute in Thailand. Uh, uh, I mean, the act activities of the Get Institute in Thailand can affect the entire policy of the Get Institute. Uh, of course, the uh, same thing can we can say about uh, the impact of the activity of a British uh, Council in Thailand to the whole British Council. And um, um, and uh, lastly, I I would like to. I express uh, my uh, impression about the whole session is like this. Uh, cultural diplomacy needs uh, culture, of course. And the soft power also needs culture, of course. But 
uh, does culture really need cultural diplomacy? And uh, does culture need soft power? If yes, in what sense or in what way, in what degree? And I think the answer lies uh, in our contemplation about the uh, essence of culture itself. When we uh, think about uh, the and uh, discuss about the essence of culture, so we, we will find the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the, Dr. Shimbasaki asked about something about the change in the Gete and the British Council. You have any quick quick comments, or can go to the Q and A sessions first? Mm, okay. okay. So let's go to move to the Q and A. So due to the time limitations, uh, I would like to allow one swift question from the auditorium, and uh, we actually have a few online questions, but unfortunately, uh, I don't think we will be able to respond that live. So we will try to get back to them and or at least respond them in the chat box. Mm -hmm. So if anybody here in the auditorium has um, a question or a comment they would like to share to the panel, please raise your hand and we will get to you with the microphone. Is there any one? Oh, okay, over there. Okay, and, and I will translate. Yes. Okay. ก็ก่อนอื่นนะคะก็ขอขอบคุณทางเจแปนฟาวเดชั่นที่ได้จัดงานนี้ขึ้นมานะคะแล้วก็รู้สึกมีความยินดีอย่างยิ่งนะคะ
Uh, one fact that I have been observing is that th for the past 10 years that um, BACC has been here um, in Bangkok, uh, we had the chance to see um, contemporary art at its own stage and we saw a lot of possibilities of how contemporary art can grow here in our country with uh, the collaborations of many cultural institutes, um, international cultural inst institutes here in Bangkok and also um, with the Thai government, the government of, uh, sorry, the Ministry of Culture and um, uh, the cultural department in the foreign ministry. And uh, so I indeed believe that collaborations are essential and we have to put our hands together um, to make things work in the future. And one more point that I would like to uh, raise the topic is how can we uh, raise the bar and focus on local artists who does not necessarily have the, the light, the spotlight on them. So how can we as uh, practitioners and cultural institutes uh, contribute to give them the stage to make them be acknowledged uh, in the international or globalized stage um, so that we can contribute to also to um, the good relations between Thai and other international countries and how we can introduce um, the, the friendship and the happiness and I strongly believe that by having this symposium today marks a good origin and a good start for that. So more of a comment rather than a question? Uh, perhaps. Yes, uh, yes, perhaps I can directly give a, s a short answer what kind of programs um, we have to support this young artist. Uh, since uh, 2020, we installed the uh, uh, Asian Pacific art residency in Leipzig for young artists, really for young artists, not for for, for the beginners. And uh, so recently we have a very wonderful young artist called Harit uh, Sri Kao. My Thai is not perfect. He is only 20, 23 years old and he spent, uh, I think he's in Leipzig since already five months and he found partners and now he will have an exhibition. Uh, and the other young artist is Oravan uh, Arunrak. She will follow him in, in January for three months. And um, this is, I think, also very important to send them in the beginning phase of their artist life and then to have the exchange with other artists, also from other countries, because these residencies are from, from different countries. So this is uh, one thing which I like to develop m much more in the future. Yes, I just like to. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. No, you go so first. You go I just like to add in terms of uh, opportunity for for young emerging Thai artists. Uh, the Bangkok Art Biennale offers uh, the open call, which allow uh, international as well as Thai artists to submit their proposals. And the last edition and this edition, we have had uh, very young. Some of them just finished universities to to show. Uh, <laughs> for example, Narong Yod or Rung Ruang, these artists uh, are showing alongside Ai Weiwei. So in this way, they, they, they have leapfrogged into the international stage already, and by creating Bangkok Abbey like here in Bangkok, we have put the destination whereby it's an international stage where the young artists get the opportunity. But also by showing younger artists, like uh, Dr. Sin was asking, uh, what about other young Chinese artists? Lu Yang, Lu Yang based in Shanghai, She's, she's also in our Bangkok Art Biennale. She, she works in digital art. So in this way, it's not just only Thai artists, but uh, other artists who, who have potentials and, and we feel that they, it's, it's, not, it's not hierarchy, it's not age. And also it's not through cultural institutions because our curator membership, our curator's team actually look at the artist's works and a lot of times don't have to go through don't, don't have to go past the cultural institution. So in this way, we, we both, uh, work both ways so that the, the artists, uh, Thai and non-Thai, get uh, the opportunity to show. Thank you. Yeah, and just, just briefly, I mean, some of, the pe some of the young craftspeople and designers we've worked with, we've uh, exhibited their work in Scotland. They've had links to various institutions in Scotland. Um, last, week, last weekend, or the weekend before, I was in Chiang Mai for the Chiang Mai Design Awards. 
four of the winners there were, were young people that we had worked with and helped them develop in their careers. Um, some of, again, some of the people now are established names and established brands in Thailand and actually beyond in, in Japan. Some of the people we've worked with too. That's in the craft scene and the creative hub scene. Uh, we also set up two years ago a new program called Connections Through Culture, which is to give um, young or emerging artists the opportunity to make those first international links. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, returning to the previous, to an earlier theme, um, is a relatively small number in the first year because flights were involved. Now they're meeting initially virtually. We're able to create far more connections than, than we were before. Thank you. Um, any comments from our online speakers? Maybe not? Okay. So uh, actually, I would like to raise one question from the online um, viewers because I think this is unable for uh, the Japan Foundation Bangkok for us to, to answer is that um, there's this question, maybe I would like to address Mr. Andrew Glass. Um, the question is, um, may I ask to the British Council or the representative about um, would the exit of the UK from the EU impact the British Council's commitment to its mission globally? <laughs> um, <coughs> okay. I <laughs> Hard to answer. Give me a second to think about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that, no. There are two things. There are two things I'd like to say about that. Um, one, I think, is that because the way we've exited, and perhaps the way that the negotiations about trade deals, etc., are going at the moment, mm -hmm. I'm picking up that. There, is, there are aspects of anti-British feeling in Europe, and perhaps the same in the UK about Europe, because of how things are happening at a political level. That makes our people-to-people -people and institution-to-institution relationships much more important in Europe going forward. You know, I, I, Brexit or no Brexit, artists based in Germany, in Berlin particularly, not just in Berlin, in Germany particularly, will still want to work with British artists, I'm yeah. sure, and yeah. with Portuguese artists and with Hungarian artists, despite you know, political challenges in that country as well. So I think you know, it's it is important that we look beyond or outside the, the politics to, to continue the people to people and um, institution to institution links. I think that, that's one thing. Um, I think another thing perhaps is that in, in terms of resources maybe, you know, the, U the UK is looking very much at what we call Indo-Pacific, uh, so there may be some prioritization of further prioritization of this, of this region. <laughs> but you know, Brexit is ultimately a political thing. Okay, it's got social, cultural, economic manifestations, etc. But um, this universities and artists and scientists are going to work together. So I don't know, Marin, how you, if you see it. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 the no, other side of the channel. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, for example, Switzerland is not yeah. part of European Union, but we are working so close together mm. with the Pro Helvetia institution and with the Swiss embassy. And I think mm. this, is, this is really two different, two different stories. And mm. um, I'm sure our good relation to the British Council will, will follow in the future. <laughs> and actually, just, just to add to that, um, I mentioned it before, when I was working in, in Serbia again in the early two, 2000s, um, political relations between the UK and the government of Serbia were very bad because of the recognition of Kosovo and other, uh, other politics going on then. Um, towards the end of my stay, I, I, some Serbian contacts said to me, you, I mean not me, but you British Council, you're the smiling face of the UK. So the political at the political level, things were not going well, but in the cultural connections, educational connections, you know, that was really appreciated. So that when gradually political things got a little bit better, um, you know, we're, we're there through good times and bad times. Thank you very much. And um, on that note, um, on that note in terms of like, you know, so I think it is very interesting how in contemporary times, how culture and cultural policy has its own existence and very organic 
existence and, um, and creating ongoing dialogues in both national and international contexts. So thank you very much um, for everybody today. Um, and thank you in, uh, indeed for Mr. Yoshioka for moderating this <coughs> session for our round table in the part two. Um, so I would like to now end this uh, international public symposium today with a closing remark uh, from Ms. Marini Meyer, Director of Goethe Institute Thailand, um, to greet as one of our co-organizers of the event today. Yeah, okay, I think the time is already running out. <laughs> Everything <laughs> is said, so I have not to repeat. Uh, it's very lively discussion. I, I'm happy I learned so much the last four hours. Uh, and I think it's, it's still so important. Also, perhaps this is a closing mark. Uh, Europe, and especially German, Germany has to look to Southeast Asia. This is so important. Sometimes, you know, Latin America, Africa is a big issue. Yes, it's an issue. Mm. Uh, and the uh, European neighbors are an issue. But Southeast Asia is also for the future, the yeah. relation, uh, from, from my perspective, uh, a little bit underperformed in this moment. So I hope for the future that we, we can try to to install the, the, the relation much more than, than it is in the moment. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So please uh, give a round of applause to everybody, all the speakers here today. Thank you very much for contributing to very insightful information for us. And we will end uh, the symposium today. So um, last thing, I would like to encourage everybody to please uh, fill out our questionnaires. Um, both online and on site. Um, the QR code is at the entrance, so we can g uh, get your insights for uh, the improvement of our future projects. Thank you very much and have a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you.